to the University of Makati's sixth research congress with the theme, Achieving Global Excellence Through Institutional Synergy. Five decades of existence is a testament to the combined vision and efforts that made the University of Makati ready for global excellence and sustainable development. The Center for University Research holds this event annually to encourage all faculty, personnel, and students to participate in research-related activities, or better yet, to do research. This is a two-day conference that aims to provide us with a better perspective of our higher education landscape. So we are grateful to everyone for uh, deciding to uh, up or uplift your research acumen with uh, us this morning. And where better to do it than in our newly renovated mini theater? Isn't it nice, everyone? Yeah. I can see a round of applause in the middle of the <laughs> in the middle of the audience. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we conducted our registration from eight o'clock uh, earlier till uh, eight forty-five. But for our online attendees, please make sure that you have registered through the Google form, which will also serve as your attendance for today's session. And for those who are physically here, I would like to think we've accomplished the forms. Thank you very much for doing so. Uh, saying hello to everyone who's joined us physically and saying good morning to our uh, university leaders, uh, mem members of the management com committee, esteemed uh, faculty, our OMREC officials. I saw several of you this morning. And of course, our uh, Center for the University Research Director, Professor De Los Santos, good morning. Good morning to everyone, students, faculty, and all our joiners. Thank you very much for deciding to uh, be here today. We'd also like to welcome the following um, academics, along with their institutions, who have served as peer reviewers for our universitas which is the official journal of the University of Makati. We'd like to acknowledge um, Leo Andrew B. Beklar, PhD, Research Director of Capis State University, Rojas City, Alfredo V. Umali, LPT, MA English, Language Learner Lead Teacher, ESL, in Lebanon City School District, Ohio, USA, Leandra S. Estadilia, LPT, MBA, PhD, St. Paul University, Quezon City, Carlo Delfin S. Estadilia MS, Basque Center for Applied Mathematics, the University of Basque Country in Spain, El Mirando T. Morris, LPT, MA, uh, RPSI, and RGC College of St. Benil de la Salle University, Manila, Juanito E. Bautista, MA Ed, Mapua University, Manila, Juan Jeffrey Yu Consignado, DBA, Colegio de San Juan de Letran, Manila, Jasmine Nadja Pinugo, PhD Program Chair, Mapua University, our university internal referees, Engineer Luke Ivan B. Moro, LPT MBA, Vice President for Finance, Professor Maria Faye Nanette M. Cariaga, RPH MS Farm, PhD EM, Vice President of uh, the Planning and Research, Ray S. Medanilla, LPTMA, former Director of the Center for Curriculum and Materials Development, MS, sorry, Miss Jennifer J. LaLuna, RL, LPT, MLIS, Director, Library Learning Commons, Camille C. Navarro, yours truly, Ildebrando G. Kadai, MA, College Secretary, Center for National Service Training, Judith J. Batin, LPT, PhD, College of Arts and Letters, Henry G. Magat, LPT, EDD, College of Arts and Letters, Chair, Umrek, Karen Gale C. Ibanez, RPSI, sorry, SY and RPM, College of Science, Diana Rose F. Gamil, LPT, MA, Office of the Vice President for Finance, Francisco M. Lambohan, Jr., RPSY, EDD, MAPSY, LMT, College of Science, and uh, Mark Philip Paderan, 
College of Arts and Letters, Vice Chair Umrek. That list just gets longer by the year, don't you think so? So we're very happy to uh, lengthen that list. We also would like to thank our sponsors for this morning. The Philippine Consortium, the leading provider of academic software, like in vivo, Wolfram Mathematica, eViews, Stata, ExcelStat, and Cita V. So um, if you had a chance to enjoy the coffee and donut this morning, we have the Philippine Consortium to thank for that. And um, where's Sir Nicamil? Where are you, sir? <laughs> so we can give a little hello and thank you for uh, our refreshments this morning. We also would like to thank um, the Office of the Vice President for Planning and Research, because today, to ensure that we are continue with our health, uh, several of us, or if not all of us, will be receiving vitamin Cs from the OVPPR. So thank you very much also. A round of applause for them. Also would thank the Office of the Bright Vice President for Academic Affairs for also lending us the Zoom link for this morning. Thank you very much. So just a few reminders for those participating online. Please make sure that your microphones are on mute. And uh, feel free to use the chat box for, uh, for your comments or questions. And make sure you stay tuned in. If you also would like to take photos, um, I am sure the CUR will be very happy if you use their hashtag, hashtag UMACRC2023, for posting the events online. So um, once again, that's hashtag UMACRC2023 for today's event. So um, let's officially begin um, requesting everyone to uh, put ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Our opening prayer and our national anthem will be led by the University of Makati Choral. Let us kindly rise. Watch me rise again 
poor mind Let the voice that come to see Go out through the rain Come the storm in me Not because of who you are Not because of what you've done Not because of what I've done but because of who you are, I am a proud, quickly fading. Here today and gone tomorrow. Wave thoughts in the ocean. Vapor and the winds to you. Hear me when I'm calling. Love to catch me when I'm falling. And you told me who I am. But because of who I am, but because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am now quickly fading. Here today and gone tomorrow. Away with us in the ocean. Paper and the wind still you. Hear me when I'm calling. Don't you catch me when you told me who I am, I am yours, I am yours, I am yours, I am yours. We may all be seated. Thank you. Once again, we would like to uh, uh, thank the University of Makati uh, Kural and of course uh, our resident uh, YouTube sensation in the university, Jeremy Novella, for that lovely um, opening prayer. Thank you for leading that uh, for this morning. Let's give them a round of applause, everyone. So once again, welcome to the 6th University Research Congress. 
thanking once again all our uh, participants, the university leaders who are present here this morning, whether uh, physically or online. I would like to acknowledge the president, uh, our university president, Dr. Alex Ursi Ramos, for uh, gracing us physically with your presence. Uh, also thanking the officials, presenters, the rapporteurs, the speakers, the UMREC officials, of course the students who are here this morning. Glad you are uh, with us. Leading the university's vision towards becoming a research-oriented institution, let's hear a few messages from a sought-after lecturer on economics, entrepreneurship, and financial literacy. He finished his BSBA in Economics and MBA at the Colegio de San Juan de Letran, Manila, and his PhD in Management at the International Academy of Management and Economics with distinction. Please help me welcome... That's what I'm doing right now, but thank you for the kind reminders to our floor director. So, um, once again, to welcome us and give the opening message, please help me welcome the University President, Dr. Alex Sorsi Ramos. Welcome to the sixth Research Congress of the University of Makati with the team Achieving Global Excellence Through Institutional Synergy. Actually, very timely itong research congress natin ngayon. Kasi nitong mga nakaraang araw, isa yan sa mga pinakamainit na pinag-uusapan namin sa trabaho namin sa uh, Congressional Commission on Education. How do we ensure excellence in universities when there is only one pathway towards achieving excellence, which is using an instrument that is geared towards research. Kaya lang, if we examine ourselves really very closely, are we really a research university? Kung hindi University of Makati ang pangalan natin, ano tayo bilang isang academic institution? Masasabi ba natin talaga na tayo ay isang research university? Hindi ba ang mandato sa atin ay mabigyan ng pagkakataon ang mga magsisipag-aral sa University of Makati na makibahagi sa mga trabaho at oportunidad na meron sa ating bayan at sa ating bansa? We have always been a professional school. In fact, even the kind of faculty members and even the kind of programs that we have is geared towards ensuring employability. Hindi naman tayo hinahanapan ng ating mayor na kailangan yung mga graduates natin ay makapag-produce ng scopus at saka index research. Hindi ba? So, bakit natin to ginagawa? Kasi kahit na hindi yan ang pangunahing mandato natin, being an educational institution, it is still part of our responsibility to contribute to the body of knowledge. And we'd like to thank, of course, our research director, our VP for planning and research in taking steps, even small steps, in ensuring that the whole UMAC academic community will not forget that we are still an academic institution and that as an academic institution, it is still our responsibility to conduct valuable research. Maybe it is not our top priority, but hopefully, hopefully, because of this research congress and the various initiatives that our uh, research director and also our VP for planning and research is conducting amongst all our faculty, amongst all our students, and every stakeholder in the University of Makati, our love for research will thrive and more meaningful research work will be developed by the University of Makati, its students and its faculty. Alam niyo po, tinitignan ko yung line-up ng mga ipepresent. Sabi ko nga, we are already maturing. We are already becoming uh, actually a university that is 
really working hard to ensure that we are producing quality material and quality research work. So, sa lahat po na magpipresenta, sa lahat po na nag-google lang oras at hirap para magawa itong mga research work nila, mabuhay po kayo. And of course, for the University of Makati officials, students, and different stakeholders, I hope, I hope that even though at this time, we may not yet be considered as a top research university, I hope that over time, especially during my leadership, together with our MANCOM officials, you know, there will come a time that UMAC will actually be also be remembered or will be known because of the research work that we have undertaken. So muli po, magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. Salamat. Thank you to our president, uh, Dr. Alexer Ramos, for that good reminder for everyone that indeed our endeavor here is our way of contributing to the body of knowledge as a, as an, as a university. So uh, let's proceed now to our meat of the matter, so to speak. Allow me to introduce our uh, first speaker for the Research Congress. He is a full professor of the Department of Filipino College of Liberal Arts, the Executive Director of the Research and Grants Management Office at De La Salle University. He is the author of books, Ang Mga Ideolohiyang Politikal ng Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines 2012, Ferdinand Blumentritt and the Philippines 2013, the Social Political Discourses of the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines 2018, and Ang Mindanao sa Hiraya ni Ferdinand Blumentritt, Blumentritt 2022. He co-authored the books From Exceptionality to Exceptional, Inclusion of Differently Abled Persons in the Workplace back in 2014, and Cataloging and Baselining the Filipino Spanish Churches of the Diocese of Maasin on the island of Leyte, 2020. He is the co-author, sorry, he is the author and co-author of over 100 articles on hermeneutics, cultural studies, heritage studies, and Filipino philosophy that are published in a number of local and international journals. He served as a visiting research professor at the Council for Research in Values and Philosophy, Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. in 2013, and at the Divinity School of Chongqi College Chinese University of Hong Kong in 2021. In 2014, Dr. Sorry, he was recognized as an outstanding alumnus in the field of philosophy by the Graduate School of the University of Santo Tomas. In 2022, he was given the Matthew Eichler, I hope I pronounced that right, Memorial Fellowship in Education by the Asia Pacific Consortium of Researchers and Educators. He is a co-founder of the Andrew Gonzalez Philippine Citation Index, where our journal is also um, accredited. Help me welcome Dr. Feorilio Demetrio on stage.
everyone. This is my first time to be in your very impressive campus. This is a very beautiful uh, theater you have here. Um, okay, I think you can see my screen already. To the administrators of the University of Makati, led by your president, Dr. Elexur Ramos, the faculty members, staff, students, friends, good morning to, to all of us. I thank Director Rante de los Santos of your Center for University Research for inviting me to be part of your sixth University Research Congress with the theme, Achieving Global Excellence Through Institutional Synergy. So it's, uh, I think I was very happy to hear from your president the idea that uh, it's very difficult to talk about excellence, global excellence in, in the academe without emphasizing research. Research is really the uh, vehicle towards global excellence because all the top universities in the world are emphasizing on research. And if we don't do it, we will be left behind by the other, by the other universities particularly the state universities now. They're positioning to produce more and more uh, uh, research uh, publications. I think that his request for me to talk about heritage writing stemmed from the incident when I shared with him an article that I wrote about the dance ritual of Obando, hoping that it might be of interest to him, being somebody from Bulacan. This invitation, this current invitation, made me seriously reflect on my work as a heritage researcher. Being an interdisciplinary professor and scholar, my researches spanned on so many topics and concerns. I work on qualitative and both uh, qualitative and quantitative research projects. Many of my colleagues are confused about what is it that, what is it actually that I'm focusing on as, as a researcher as a professor also. I just recently realized that it is heritage that actually bind my otherwise diverse research projects together. Admittedly, I work on intangible heritage, such as the intellectual heritage of Filipino philosophers. I am currently, I have just translated some of the German and Spanish uh, works of Ferdinand Blumentritt, so from Spanish and German to Filipino. And I'm currently translating another work of Ferdinand Blumentritt on ancient Filipino religion from German to Filipino. That's part of my work on the intangible heritage. I also had a paper on the dance rich, uh, on the Moro Moro of Nueva Ecija. It's called the Arakio of Nueva Ecija. But I also work on the uh, movable, tangible heritage, such as the paintings of Botong, Francisco. Carlos Francisco, the alcoholic beverages of Samar and Leyte, the hablon textile of Miagao. And I also even work on immovable, tangible heritage, such as the antique houses of Las Casas Filipinas de Acosar, the Filipino Spanish churches of Leyte, that's part of a book that I co authored with a good friend of uh, uh, Director Rante from the Visayas State University. and. Now, I'm currently working with some of my students profiling the disaster risk of uh, the Filipino Spanish churches in Batangas and in Pampanga. There are so many of them. There are so many antique churches in Batangas, in the province of Batangas, and as well as in the, in the province of Pampanga. But why is heritage studies important for us? Why should we spend time and energy studying our heritage? First, we should be documenting these tangible and intangible things whose existence are threatened by age and by our fast-changing society. So in just a matter of 10 years, so many things will change. And many of us will not be able to remember anymore some of the intangible uh, heritage artifacts or uh, elements that we have. For example, in my work in, in Leyte, I was trying to document the uh, alcoholic beverages. And uh, there, we have this, uh, we have this uh, beverage that is equivalent to the, uh, the uh, sugarcane wine of Ilocos. And we have honey wine. Uh, I think in Mindanao, they're still making honey wine. But we cannot make this anymore 
because the leaf that we use as, as a source for our natural yeast is no longer identifiable by the people in Leyte. So that's how fast things can happen. And if we don't document things properly, we will not be able to remember anymore the elements of our, of our uh, intangible and even tangible uh, uh, heritage. Yeah. For example, we don't, uh, ordinary Filipinos would not understand anymore the binding material, the material used in binding the stones for our uh, Filipino Spanish churches. We have to do a little research in order for us to discover that it's not cement, it's not Portland cement that is the best binding material for these stones. In fact, Portland cement might damage this masonry that we have in our old churches. Second, by studying these things, we become more capable of appreciating them and conserving them for future generations. Third, researching heritage will make us understand ourselves better. The pool of knowledge that we create can be the foundations of research-driven policies in the near future. Fourth, we will be able to create materials that can enrich the contents of our subjects. The students will be more interested in learning if what we talk about in the classroom are things that are concrete to them. That's why research is really very important to infuse our pedagogy, to infuse, to enrich our, our pedagogy. Otherwise, we will be forced to use materials coming from foreign textbooks, things that are totally alien uh, from, from, the pers from the point of view of our stu students. So research will make us talk about more and more about the realities that surround us. So we will talk about our own problems, our own concerns, instead of the concerns of other, other people from other places of the world. Fifth, since our students are required to make research projects, tangible and intangible heritage are good subject matter for their projects. Interdisciplinary approach to them. So an engineering, engineering students can do heritage studies. Business students can do heritage studies. And humanity students can do heritage studies. Computer science students can do heritage studies as well. Sixth, the documentation of the local heritage should, should contribute to the conceptualization or imagination of the national. So we cannot imagine the national without looking at the local. So we have to inductively produce the national discourse. So our problem now is that when you say national, the national identity, this is the identity of Metro Manila because knowledge is produced in Metro Manila. But if we scatter, if we, other places in our country will also be producing their own uh, research projects about their own environment, their own context, then more and more our national imagination will be enriched. What will I do in the next 30 or 35 minutes of time given to my 36 minutes there? Is that I will talk about one heritage studies project that I did with my collaborators and wrap up this, sum with, this up with some suggestions on how you may further strengthen your heritage studies projects in your university. I decided to showcase today our study on church facade that was published in an international journal on archaeology. The title of this paper is A Diachronic Analysis of the Facades of the Filipino Spanish Churches of the Diocese of Maasin in the Context of Slave Raids from the South. So I'm talking about the effect of the Moro raids on the design of the facades of, of these uh, seven Filipino Spanish churches in the Diocese of Maasin, southern part of the island of Leyte. This paper is written with Dr. Fernandez, Dr. Liwanag, and architect Rafi Andrew Loreto from VSU and was published in Spafa Journal in, based in Bangkok, Thailand, a journal of archaeology. It so happened that the seven Filipino Spanish churches of the Diocese of Maasin were built across more than three centuries. So they were not built simultaneously, but some were built over a span of three centuries. Some were built here this time, and, and so on. Okay? So from the first one was built around 1635 to 1650, while the last one was built starting 1892. So this is the timeline. Uh, these are the locations of our seven heritage churches relative to the Philippine fault line. That's the fault line. And uh, the Philippine fault line is there. And relative to the 22 active and dormant 
volcanoes of the island of Leyte. So this, this map that, I, that we did, based on uh, some, some um, hazard maps, this is what convinced NCCA to give us the grant. Okay, we were able to say, look at these churches. They're very near the fault line. Look at these churches. They're very near the active and dormant volcanoes of Leyte. So we should be documenting these churches. We wondered whether there was a correlation between the facade designs of these churches with the waxing and waning of the Moro raids. So you will see the location of Leyte there, and it's really very near, near the, uh, the uh, Iligan Bay and the uh, Sambuanga, the Sambuanga uh, Strait. Okay, so it's really very near. These are the exit points of the Moro raiders. So either they will go to Ilana Bay or Iligan Bay, or they will, uh, they will move here from Sambuanga around. And, and then Leyte is very, really very near. Okay, so this is the timeline of the construction of the churches. Uh, around the, uh, the 1634 Moro raid destroyed the Bay Bay Pueblo and forced the inhabitants to transfer to Barangay Punta. So that's why we know the creation of the Punta Chapel. That's the first uh, earliest, earliest uh, uh, structure that we documented in uh, the southern part of Leyte. It's some, some uh, Leyte has three provinces, southern Leyte, then you have Leyte, and then you have Biliran. Uh, so um, we are talking about the, the southern part, not, not the entire southern part, so some portion of the province of Leyte are part of this, of this uh, locale that we're talking about. Then the 1754 Moro raids destroyed Maasin Pueblo and San Juan Pueblo, and Hilongo's church was uh, siege, was, was uh, put under siege. And then this portion here in the timeline, sometime in the 1780s, the Spaniards shifted their na naval strategy. Instead of using Spanish boats, they started using Moro boats and mounted this with more powerful guns. This undermined the naval superiority of the Moro raiders. For a long time, using the Moro boats, the Moro raiders were superior on the seas or on the seas because their boats were very fast and their boats were very light. They can travel near the coastlines. They can carry their boats even and cross a small island and the uh, Spanish galeras, the, the Spanish boats, will not be able to, to pursue this very fast Moro boats. So around 1780s, things changed. The Spaniards realized that it's better not to use the Spanish boats, but to use the Moro boats. So they copied the Moro boats, and then they placed bigger guns there on the Moro boats, and now they can pursue the Moro raiders. So around 1780s, Moro raids waned, started to decline. The frequency and the uh, immensity of the attacks started to decline. So they, could, they were no longer interested in staging frontal attacks, sieges. sieges. No, they're not interested anymore in sieges. They go for a small-scale kidnapping of fishermen, isolated settlements. Then, uh, so these are the churches. In our paper, we call these churches the Moro Raids Period Church. So these are the Punta Chapel, the Hilongos Church, and the Masin Cathedral. I will show pictures in a little while. And then we call these churches the post Moro Raids Period Churches because our cutoff is 1780s. Our cutoff is 1780s. So the Moro Raids Period and the post Moro Raids Period shaped four types of facade designs in the Diocese of Maasin. And these are the Visita facade, Moro Raids period, the Fortress Romanesque facade, Moro Raids period still, and then we have the Romanesque neoclassical facade, early Moro Raids period, and then you have the Romanesque Baroque facade, late Moro Raids period. Punta Chapel used to be a Pueblo church after Bye Bye Pueblo was sacked by a raiding party under Sultan Kudarat. We noticed that its original masonry was just a perimeter skirt 
we deduced that its upper half was originally composed of lighter materials such as bamboo, wood, or the tabique pampango, or our version of the wattle and dove. So tabique pampango is actually sawale, sawale, then it will be coated with, it will be plastered with lime mortar. So it's a very economical, it's a very uh, functional, a very functional material. We forgot this material already, but this is very common in uh, small churches in those times. I think in, in Bohol, before the earthquake, portions of the convento, portions of the churches were, were tabike pampango. So, sawali, and then it will be coated with uh, a very thin coat of, of uh, lime mortar. Punta Chapel is still located near the shoreline, but on an elevated landmass. Its location offers a good vantage point in detecting approaching Moro vessels. The lightness of the construction could have been meant to be, for it to be abandoned during attacks and just repaired afterwards. Hilongos Church and Maasim Cathedral are the structures with fortress Romanesque facade. The old San Juan Church was demolished, that was demolished in the 1890s, probably also had a fortress Romanesque facade. Certainly, it was a fortified church. So this is an example. This is Hilongos Church. So this church is, is, has a massive fortification because the Jesuits used to live in this, in this complex. So you will see the fortification of the church. The, the black ones are still existing. The gray ones are damaged now. So when you say fortress facade, the facade of the church is part of the fortress. So unlike the fortified churches that you probably know of, these churches are inside the fortifications. That's not a fortress facade. A fortress facade is, is like this. You see the facade, and then the walls are there. The walls are there. So it, it would appear that the, the main entran entrance of the church is also a gate for the fortification. So the church is a, a, an entrance, one of the entrances for the fortification. So I'm not very sure if there are fortress facades in Luzon, but uh, in, in Leyte, this is common. In Kapul, the famous uh, Kapul Island in Samar, uh, we also have this uh, fortress, fortress uh, church. The church is not inside the fort, but the facade of the church is part of the fortification, part of the walls. A fortress Romanesque facade, so this is Maasin uh, Cathedral, so you will see that uh, uh, that's uh, the floor plan, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the map, the footprint of the church is there, and the existing uh, parts of the fortifications are the black ones. The gray ones, they're, they're lost now. The, uh, the diocese uh, decided to dismantle, to uh, destroy, to uh, demolish the, uh, the fortification. A fortress Romanesque facade is characterized by its being part of the fortification and by its impenetrability as well by its defensive bell towers. Romanesque architecture is supposed to be an early medieval style. Its presence in the 18th century Philippines could be a product of its simplicity as well as of the limitations imposed by the construction materials used at the time. Rubble and mortar, cut stones are just claddings. So you don't imagine, if you're going to imagine uh, Filipino Spanish churches, usually the stones that you will see are just very thin. They are not blocks. They are more like tiles than blocks. Inside or be, be, behind these tiles are mortar and rubble, mortar and rubble structures. You cannot make so many, uh, so tall, so, so tall, so thin structures using uh, rubble and mortar. Bye Bye Church and Malitbog Church are structures with Romanesque neoclassical facades. So this is now post, these are now post uh, Moro raids period. The waning, the waning of the Moro raids period. They have more elaborate facade that are easily penetrable. Their bell towers are no longer designed as defensive systems. They can be alarm systems, but they are no longer defensive systems. What, what I mean by that is that you can attack Okay, so it's, it's no longer safe to stay in the tower during the attack. In the fortification, in the, fort, in the fort, uh, fortification facade churches, you can stay in the bell tower. You are safe there during an attack. But here, it's not safe anymore to stay in the bell tower during the attack because 
they can access, easily access the bell tower. The builders' energy and creativity that were previously used to make the structure impenetrable were now used to beautify the facade. So instead of a simple, very brutal facade, what you have now are elaborate, more aesthetic looking facade. But they can be easily attacked this time. They're not afraid of it because there were no more attacks from, from the south coming in. And Matalam Church and the 1892 San Juan Church are structures with Romanesque Baroque facade. We can see how the rigid geometry of the Romanesque neoclassical facade were abandoned in favor of the more playful and energetic, energetic curving lines. So we have a very beautiful church in San Juan. This is uh, just 500 kilometers, uh, 500 meters, or I can, I can call 50 kilometers, uh, 50 kilometers or so behind or in front of, of an active volcano. And uh, I think they were not able to construct the bell tower. They ran out of funds. So what they had is a wooden bell tower. But the wooden bell tower, after so many years, it collapsed. Then they constructed this very modern, ultra-modern bell tower. Okay, so they're not congruent. The designs is not congruent. But the church is really very beautiful Baroque church. The Romanesque aspect of the neoclassical and Baroque facade designs remained in the sense that the interiors of these post modern age structures were still dark and its load-bearing walls squat and massive. This is an example where a research on local culture and arts aims to contribute something to the national discourse. We tried to offer the idea that not all Filipino Spanish churches were meant to be fortresses. So we, have the, we have this notion that these Filipino churches, they were meant to be a refuge, a place of refuge whenever moral raids happen. Not all of them. Some of them, yes, but many of them, no, they were not designed to be like that. Some were designed to be abandoned. When the Moro, uh, when the Vinta, Moro Vintas come, they will just run. Then the Moro will probably burn the church. No problem. When they return, they will rebuild because the church is just made of very light materials anyway. And not, not all Filipino Spanish churches can be called earthquake baroque. So we are trying to correct, we're trying to correct the notion. Whenever you see a Filipino Spanish church, you will say, that is Baroque, earthquake Baroque. That is earthquake Baroque. We were able to trace the origin of that mistake, and it came from an appropriation of a South American coffee table book about the churches in Latin America. Latin America, not, South, not, not, not just South America, Central and South America. When the author of that book was talking about the earthquake Baroque churches of Latin America, Central and South America. We looked at the pictures of these churches. They were really Baroque structures, similar to the last churches that we have. Okay, very elaborate, very elaborate design. So, in the Philippines, when we see a Filipino Spanish church, it's not automatically earthquake Baroque. Okay, we can talk about we can talk about neoclassical baroque. You can talk uh, neoclassical earthquake structure, or we can talk about Romanesque earthquake structure. Meaning to say, earthquake in the sense that they were supposed to be built with uh, uh, with uh, the threat, with the risk of earthquake in mind. They're, they're, they were designed to withstand uh, the threat of earthquake. I have seven pointers on how to strengthen your heritage studies projects. First, instead of doing your own research projects, I'm talking to the professors, collaborate with your students by mentoring them well from conceptualization to final defense. Research and teaching should be integrated. So your students will have more chances of having their works published if they collaborate with their professors. Professors can have better chances of having research, substantial research output if they collaborate with their students. Instead of compartmentalizing research and teaching, it should be better for your university to, integ to integrate teaching and research 
because you can be more productive in that sense. If, you, if, you, if you're going to do it that way, you collaborate with your students, you teach them how to do research, you teach them, you lead them, you guide them so that their papers can be published. Second, join in conferences as paper presenters. I'm very happy that there are a number of papers to be presented in this, in this Congress. This is the way where you can, uh, this is the, the uh, venue where you can talk about your research. You can gather feedback for your research and you can get ideas for future, for future projects, especially if you are teaching in uh, the University of Makati. You will get so much ideas for your present and future projects from these conferences. Third, see to it that the best works of your best students are co-published by you. This should become part of the knowledge pool. This should become part of the literature so that the research projects of your students would not be repetitive but would be building on the previous studies. So if you're not going to publish it, the next time around some some other people will, will realize, oh, I'm going to work on that one. And they're going to repeat the whole, the whole thing. But if you have published this, then there will be a chance that other people will be building on the knowledge that you already produced. Fourth, as you mentor your students, you can actually train yourselves as better researchers. Co-publishing your students' works can actually build your confidence and capacity as mentors and researchers. Remember that teaching research is best done when the teachers are also researchers. So are we not afraid of uh, predatory mentoring practice? Yes, that's a possibility. But uh, in De La Salle University, we encourage our faculty members to be publishing with their students. In fact, we don't allow our students to publish on their own. We require our students to have a co-author, the faculty members as uh, their advisors, as co-authors. So our idea there is that students left on their own, they will not be able to publish anyway. So if professors are publishing with their students, that is a sure sign that our professors are actually helping our students, are investing extra time, extra energy on the students' projects so that they will, they will be co-authors with, with our students. Fifth, your university can consider shifting from the use of the traditional thesis format to the use of the article format. So De La Salle University Senior High School is already using this format, and this caused the increase in our senior high school students' publications. So instead of submitting the traditional thesis that is very difficult to convert, we ask our students, write your thesis in the form of a journal article, and then whoever Whoever among our senior high school students can publish ahead of their final defense, no need for them to defend. No need for them to have final defense. No need for them to have final defense. So our college departments now are copying the success story of our senior high school students. So our senior high school students, it's uniform. All of you should be writing articles instead of journal articles, instead of the traditional thesis. In our college departments, some of the departments are shifting, following the lead of our senior high school because they saw the success story of our senior high school students. They can publish even in Scopus journals. Sixth, archival research is a good methodology for these kinds of study. You can go to your city and parish archives, municipal or city archives, you can go to your government and school libraries for old records. There is even a chance that we can get some digitized materials from the internet. Then seventh, oral history is another good methodology for these kinds of study. Oral history happens when we systematically interview elderly key informants about certain cultural or artistic, or artistic phenomenon. It would be helpful if the recordings or transcript, transcripts of such interviews will be deposited in an archive after we have used them for our own projects. So it's good to have an oral history archive because many of our students will be doing interviews instead of appending their transcripts, instead of, I don't know, how do you keep your excess 
the, the raw records, the raw recordings, you can deposit them to the archives. No need for your students to do those very uh, lengthy, very lengthy uh, transcripts of interviews and append them to the thesis. This can be deposited in the archives later on. I hope I was able to convey to you my three points in this very short talk this morning, namely, the significance of studying our tangible and intangible heritage, a sample presentation of my works on immovable tangible heritage. I was talking about the interaction of the facade design with the moral rates, and we wanted to replicate that study somewhere, maybe in, maybe in Bohol, no, no, Bohol, I think most of the churches in Bohol were damaged. I think Cebu or Negros, it would be okay if we can replicate the studies, or we're thinking even of having, of taking a look at the, uh, the uh, churches in Marinduque, uh, trying to validate if the same thing can be seen, the pattern of facade designs can be seen, correlated to the waning, the waxing and waning of the Moro raids from the south. And then I have given you some pointers, shared with you some pointers on how to make your heritage studies studies projects more efficient, enjoyable, and rewarding. I'm aware that you have heritage studies program in, in the city or in the university because you have a very rich, Makati City is a very rich, a very rich um, heritage-wise, financially-wise, a very rich city. So I'm now ready to face your comments and reactions and requests for clarifications and questions. I have 13 minutes for some, to entertain some questions. Thank you very much. Hello, there we go. Thank you for your patience. And once again, uh, a round of applause for Dr. Demeterio. I'm sure we had a lot of takeaways. It's uh, great to be brought back to Humanities 1 and 2, how uh, lime and honey are the best um, cementers, so to speak, for our churches. And um, it's interesting to listen to how heritage studies it's actually linked hand in hand with disaster resilience, and both of which is, are uh, topics that are very crucial as far as um, the city government of Makati is concerned. So wonderful to hear both of them merged in your uh, studies. We are open for more questions because I, I think you finished uh, earlier than usual. So there are microphones, and I believe at my left and at my right, they're now both working. So uh, our university leaders, faculty, we um, enjoin you to please ask your questions. Uh, questions through Zoom will be forwarded to me. So, and there is actually one already ready for asking. So first question, can you highlight any future plans or directions for your work in heritage studies or related projects? Oh, somebody may want to co-author with you, Dr. Demeterio. Please go ahead. Um, so, uh, this is a very difficult question to answer. Uh -huh. If uh, I, I heard President uh, Ramos, your president, uh, he's involved with uh, EDCOM 2. In De La Salle University, we're also busy with EDCOM 2, actually. Um, 
So we have groups there funded by our university. We're trying to churn out some policies for EDCOM 2. So aside from, aside from heritage studies, I'm not sure if I can consider our study of HEIs, research in HEIs, as also heritage. Yes, I also, I can also, I can actually insist that it's also heritage studies. Because uh, in my talks, I go around the country talking about research. I always point out that the reasons why it's really very difficult for us to do research in our country is we don't have a real research university. So UP claims that it's a research university. De La Salle claims that it's a research university. But I'm not, I doubt if UP and La Salle are really done with their transition. A research university is a university that teaches students not knowledge anymore, but how to produce knowledge. A research university is predominantly a graduate, graduate school. It's predominantly a graduate school university. And we don't have that university yet. So part of my heritage studies is actually trying to look at educational institutions. The reason why we don't have research universities in the country is that we were product of colonization. Spain, when the, when the research university was invented in Germany 200 years ago, Spain was our master, was our colonial master. Spain was unwilling to give us a research university. Spain was unable to give us, incapable of giving us a research university. When the Americans came, maybe they had plans to make UP a research university, but they were overwhelmed by the demands for professional Filipinos. Just like what your president mentioned. The University of Makati is burdened with the task of producing professionals. Okay, so that's, that's really what, what, uh, what is uh, burdening many of our universities in the Philippines now. So they cannot afford to do that easy transition from a teaching university into a research university. So that's one of my preoccupations now, talking about research in Philippine higher education. In terms of heritage, I mentioned that I have ongoing projects with my students in Batangas and my students in, in Pampanga, trying to document or trying to profile the disaster risk of each of this. I think there are 16 churches, Filipino-Spanish churches in, in, in Batangas and about 20 or so in Pampanga. There are so many of them. There are so many of them. And then I might have this project. I'm, I'm part of the team now. We're waiting for our funding to be released. We're studying the old Spanish fortifications in the island of Samar. So these are, these are uh, forts against the Moro raids also, but some of them are naval bases actually. So these are designed to have offshore barracks, naval barracks, so that when the Vintas come, they will pursue the Vintas. They will not wait for the Vintas to land on shore. They will pursue these Vintas. So we have documented a number of structures, more than 10 structures in, in Samar, some in very bad shape, and I hope I will be, our funding will be released and I can join the team uh, doing that documentation in Samar. So fortifications. Some are church fortifications. Some are naval barracks. Some are simple watchtowers. So that's my direction in as far as, in as, far as uh, tangible, immovable tangible heritage is concerned. For uh, intangible heritage, I have so many projects with my students right now. So I have so many projects with my students about uh, intangible uh, heritage. Able to answer the question. Hi. Good morning, sir. Thank, first of all, thank you for uh, saying yes to us in uh, coming over to talk about your heritage uh, writing um, experiences. Uh, I just want to say that I'm glad that you mentioned uh, what you have been doing in La Salle, that uh, your uh, senior high school students are making use of this uh, article template format in writing their uh, thesis. 
I'm glad that you mentioned that because I'm trying to convince some uh, deans to actually do the same so that the students uh, will become used to writing uh, journal articles and be published eventually, hopefully. Yeah, so in that case, I can make use that point that you have raised uh, for me to convince them more and more and adopt the same. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Ah, uh, sir, sorry. Uh, so I'm Professor Arnel Leonardo, one of the members of the Makati Cultural Mapping Project of UMAC <coughs> and also of uh, uh, City of Makati. So one of the problems, uh, supposed to be I'm uh, about to do a presentation, but I would help my presentation because of two reasons. One of the reasons is the credibility of the secondary sources that I have. And the second one, if I am not convinced if the output of my, if my research output can be, if my output is, can be considered as a research because it is mostly narration of what transpired to a certain area that, uh, that as was assigned to me. So my question is, how can, can you give us some tips on how can we, if secondary sources can be a credible source of a heritage study and if the narration of a certain development of what is assigned to me is the development of Ayala Avenue can be considered as a heritage study or a research output. Because our educational system is very much exposed on quantitative researches and on statistics, and they are not yet. I, I am not sure if the educational system is ready for cultural mapping research output. Because kami din mismo, we're not yet sure if our output can be considered as a research output. So, you know. And I think you should, uh, I, I, you're using oral, oral, lit, oral uh, history. You're using interviews. Actually, in Secondary. my case, because we find it difficult to have oral history because wala na po kang uh, existing. Okay. Uh, and then secondly, uh, mostly secondary sources, kasi yung sa akin po kasi is Ayala Avenue, those people behind the development of Ayala Avenue, ay hindi na po siya makakausap kasi yeah, they're prominent. And secondly, yung mga tao dun is uh, mahirap makakontak for personal uh, conversation. So basically, secondary lang and the archives are not that available yet. When you say secondary, these are uh, newspapers, readings, magazines? Readings, magazines, yes, yung mga online out ano. so dun ako nag base so uh, uh, i'm not sure if that will be yeah, yeah. considered as a credible sources I, I see your point i see your point so maybe when you talk about blogs maybe you should be very careful but if you're talking about archival magazines archival magazines magazine issues 1970s 1980s magazine issues newspaper issues featuring ayala Ayala Avenue. Yes, th th this will be very, very uh, credible sources. This will be very credible sor sources. So I suggest that uh, you figure out, you start writing your paper, and you should publish that paper so that you will have uh, the first study about, about Ayala Avenue. I will mention one paper that I wrote with my student. This is about the uh, De La Salle Hall. The De La Salle Hall. So the hall that you will see in De La Salle University, that, that hall is already 100 years old. So it's older than USD, USD's main building, by about four or five years older, but many people will think that USD main building is older than De La Salle because we always paint our, we always paint, repaint our, our St. La Salle Hall in De La Salle University, but that's 100 years old building. So what we did is we have, we had interviews with key individuals. So one is the, uh, the one in charge with the campus planning. Another one is, is an, is an uh, heritage expert. Another one is an old brother and so on. And we just compiled the interviews. We placed an introduction. We placed the transcript cleaned, of course, cleaned, of course. We excised the repetitions, <coughs> the, uh, the uh, rumbling, the rumbling narrations, we excised, we shortened, and then we published the interviews, three interviews in a row. We placed an introduction, 
and we placed our own conclusion. And that, that, that was it. That was it. We were able to publish that. And that's documentation already of, of uh, St. LaSalle Hall. And we dedicated that paper on the first 100 years of, uh, 100 years anniversary of, of St. LaSalle Hall. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You should not be the one to, de to tell whether it's publishable or not. Make the paper and then let the journal editors decide whether it's publishable or not. Uh, thank you, sir. Because supposedly I'm not, I don't have plans uh, to pursue, but because of your presentation, yes. be because of your talk, I totally ko po yung study ko about Ayala Avenue, which yes. is very inspiring talaga yung yes. topic niya. Yes. Thank you, po. So supposedly that's, that's a runway, right? That's a runway. That's part of an airport, an airfield. So that's very interesting. And there's a very expensive restaurant there, <coughs> Blackbird, I think Blackbird. Actually, uh, this is study ko, it focuses on the social, cultural, and political yes. essence of the Ayala Avenue. Yes. So, yun lang din lang akong bahasa nung convince nung una. But because of your presentation, yes. siguro kaya kong magiging maganda siya, sir. Don't Thank censor you yourself. Don't censor yourself. Let the editors decide. Let the editors decide. Hi, Professor. Good morning, po. I'm uh, Professor Pascual from College of Science. I found your proposal to collaborate with our students quite interesting. So I just would like to ask, po, Prof, if how did this partnership impact the research outcomes? And what advice could you give us, educators like us or researchers uh, looking to engage students in co-authorship opportunities? Thank you so much, Pa. Uh, I think... Uh the impact is uh, it really increased the publication of our senior high school. We had this campaign prior to the creation of our senior high school. We tried to convince our departments, our college departments, they were hesitant, they were hesitant. But I was able to convince the senior high school. When we opened our senior high school, I was able to convince the research managers of senior high school. And they were able to show that, yes, it's very easy to join conferences with your students if they write their papers in the article format. Because it's really very difficult. It's very tedious to convert a full thesis into a journal article. But if you start with a journal article in mind, <coughs> then you can submit it ahead, much ahead of your, of your final defense. You can bring it to conferences very, very easily. So you can have an agreement with your student. You can say, we can, we can collaborate. We can collaborate, or we should be collaborating on this. In some cases, in some universities, you're talking about laboratories. Even the research groups are called laboratories. Social science research group is called a laboratory. So in their laboratories, all paper, all paper that comes out, every paper rather that comes out from that laboratory, it's automatic. The supervisor is a co-author. That's, that's, that's the practice in, in many countries, in many countries. And in the Philippines, we're hesitant to do it. Why, why should we be hesit, hesit, hesitating to do it? We should do it. We try. And it will increase your, it will increase your track record as an advisor, as a professor also, as an academic, because you will be putting in your CVs your publications. <coughs> The danger there is for Yuma. The danger there is for Yuma. Because other SUCs might be interested in, in recruiting you in other SUCs. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how competitive, how, how big is the difference between the salaries of SUCs and Yuma. But that's really the danger. Every time I talk to pub, private schools, the danger is always, are we really sure about co-publishing, about developing our capacity as researchers, how about the SUCs? Because if we are successful in our program, the SUCs will be doing their head, head hunting. They will get your best professors. So that's, that's just my, just as a, little, a little warning for you, Matt. Uh, if you are successful in your, in your collaboration with your students, the SUCs might get you. The SUCs might get you. Thank you very much. Uh, Camille. Good morning, Dr. Demeterio. My name is Ederson Tapia. I'm from the College of Continuing Advanced and Professional Studies of the University. 
I hope you will pardon me because I have three questions. The first has to do with the meets and bounds of this so-called heritage studies. As you alluded to earlier, we were doing, we are doing heritage studies here. In fact, one, it's one of the required courses now for all students in the university. But my question has to do with the disciplinary issues involved in doing heritage studies. I am not sure whether majority of the people doing heritage studies fall squarely within the fields of history or related fields, but maybe would it also be access accessible to people in my field, which is public administration? Uh, so I don't know if, if there are strong disciplinary issues in people conducting heritage studies. That's the first question. The second question has to do with um, collaboration in research. It's, it's always an interesting proposition. However, um, as you are, I'm sure you're, you're aware of this, there are some ethical concerns that have been expressed by, by many. Um, I don't know if the Philippines is much more concerned about the ethical issues than other countries. But, and this is, the, we're not even talking about collaboration between faculty and students. We're, we're talking about collaboration between senior faculty and junior faculty. No, who gets to get top billing and, and the like. No? And this is also important for purposes of assigning uh, points for promotion purposes. That's the second. I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know how LaSalle is doing this in safeguarding ethical considerations. The third um, question piqued my interest because I'm from the graduate school of the university. This conversion of um, um, instead of asking the students to do big thesis projects, instead, uh, I mean, encourage them to just do article publication. That's very useful. But my question is whether you think the academic atmosphere in the in not only in La Salle, but in the country would already be receptive to this kind of innovation. I do know that the PhD in political science program of La Salle is experimenting on something like this. And I'm also aware that many of our colleagues in the natural sciences have been doing small journal articles in lieu of a big thesis or research project. I'm just not sure if we in the social sciences are already ready. I don't know anybody from, from UP who has done um, journal submissions as a substitute for a big traditional thesis. So I just want to pick your brains on those issues. Thank you. The first one is about disciplinary boundaries. Um, I think heritage studies should be interdisciplinary. It should be interdisciplinary. So for example, the team that I'm joining in, in Samar is the, uh, the school of uh, the Center for uh, the Conservation of Cultural Property in the Tropics in, in UST. So in my team, in that team rather, one is an expert in economics, another is an expert on material science, another is an, a two or three are architects, and so on. I'm the one taking care of history. So I think heritage study should be interdisciplinary. If you are working on a, on a single discipline, it's okay, it's okay. But be open to collaboration. It's richer to investigate heritage studies if you do it in an interdisciplinary way. The second question is about assigning points. It's about the ethics involved in uh, collaboration. So I am lucky that in our university, collaboration is understood better than in many institutions in the country. So for example, we don't divide points by authors, by the number of authors. So if a journal article is 20 points or five points or 10 points, each author will get 10 points. So there's no need for us to say, are you the lead author, are you? No. The lead authorship is only crucial if we move from associate professor to full professor. They will, on, they will only ask you, give us at least two journal articles in which you are the lead author. And that's it. It will happen again once you move to distinguished full professor ranks. So, in our university, in the La Salle University, we give incentives, publication incentives. We don't count the students as divisors in our publication incentives. In publication incentives, yes, we divide by the number of authors. So two, uh, two authors, you get 
25,000 instead of 50,000. But if the other author is a student, you get, you get the full incentive because we encourage professors to collaborate with students. I have a publication, I have 10 students with me, I will get the full amount. I will get the full amount. Because these are my students. I'm, I'm paid to mentor, to mentor them, so to say. The other question about whether the possibility of using this at the graduate school, the article format, I think it's a little bit difficult to immediately bring this at the graduate level. So maybe graduate, undergraduate level, yes, it's easier. At the graduate level, yes, we were arguing for that in the La Salle University for the natural sciences, for the natural sciences, because that's basically the, the contents. The journal article is basically what a thesis in science and technology could contain. The other tables might be placed as, as appendices. So what I know now is that we have some programs in the La Salle University in which the publications will be collated, will be collated. So when the student comes in, he will be asked or she will be asked to do the publications. And then afterwards, if she was able, if he was able to make four publications or five publications, this will be collated, an introduction will be made, and a synthesis will be made, and it will be presented as a thesis. Yes, we're, we're doing that already. We're doing that already. Not in all programs, not in all programs, but yes. So I suggest that the article format can be used as a starting point in your senior high school maybe, or in your undergraduate programs. Maybe you can have some debates later on as to, as to using it at the, graduate, at the graduate program. I hope I was able to answer. Um, we have time for one more question. Although I know, I understand there were actually three lined up queuing for uh, being able to ask it personally. So if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Demeterio, what we will do is to collect those questions and send it to you and send it back to those who uh, personally wanted to ask. But there is one more um, question online that we will indulge. What made you endorse the way thesis research implemented at De La Salle Univ University be likewise done? Yes. by other institutions. So I'm, I'm always talking about this every time I have the opportunity. I have so many invitations. I move around the country. This afternoon, I have a workshop online with uh, Southern Leyte State University. Then next week, face-to-face -face with them. I usually tell them. In Mindanao, I, I will say the same thing. Because this will, this will, actually, this will actually help our institutions having more publications, have more publications. This will help our teachers, our professors, to have the confidence to mentor research, to mentor and to teach research properly. Because it's a way of us. We're very busy. We're very busy. But with the additional energy coming from our students, we might be able to build our own publication research track record. And this is a very, this is a very efficient way. This is a very efficient way. Your if you are the advisor, it's easy to advise having an article format. If you are a panelist, it's easy to do paneling if you have the article format. If you are a student, it's easier to write quality paper than waste your time trying to beef up, to, to multiply the number of pages because students and teachers and panelists and advisors usually have this in mind, have this bias. If your thesis is this, this thick, no quality. Your thesis is that thick, maybe there is quality. So you will be asking, you will be encouraging your students to waste so much time. Waste your time, waste the panelists' time, waste the students' time. If we're going to do it sm smaller number of pages, fewer number of pages, but quality instead of quantity, then I think we will be doing research much better, more efficient. And it will be shared to everyone. It will be shared to everyone. Become part of the literature if it can be published. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Demeterio, for sharing your time and your, your knowledge with everyone. And at this point, 
Uh, we would like to request our uh, members of the management to, uh, committee to please join us on stage as we issue our certificate of appreciation to Dr. Demeterio. There are several questions still um, queuing. We will send it to you through email, sir. And uh, are we ready uh, for those? Oh, our Vice President for Planning and Research, Dr. Maria Fainanet Carriago will be joining us. Also, our University Secretary, Ma'am Juvie Hermesura, will be joining us this morning. And of course, the Director for Center for University Research, uh, Florante de los Santos, and the Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Ederson Didi Tapia. And while they're posing and giving their smiles, please allow me to read. The Certificate of Appreciation is presented to Dr. Fiorillo A. Demetrio III for the invaluable knowledge imparted as resource speaker during the 6th Research Congress with the theme Achieving Global Excellence Through Institutional Synergy. Signed October 11 and 12, 2023 at the University of Makati. Um, signed, Dr. Alexer C. Ramos, Ph.D. Cesef, Professor Florate de los Santos, RGC, and Maria Fain and Ed Carriaga, RPH, MSH, MSPH, Ph.D. Another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, on a personal note, thank you, Dr. Demeterio. There's finally a face to the emails that we've been uh, sending to your good office. Proceeding now to our next speaker. She obtained her Master of Science in uh, Public Health and Genetic Counseling at the University of La Salette and University of the Philippines, Manila. She was a former instructor at the Mountain Province State Polytechnic College, Bontoc Campus. Included in her voluntary work were the following, or are the following. She's a member of the Philippine Consortium for Science, Mathematics, and Technology, a facilitator during the Namasha bilingual recreational camp in Kaohsiung Medical University, Kaohsiung City, Taiwan, volunteered during the medical dental mission held at the Senior Citizen Center in Lamut Efogao, a lifetime member of the Integrated Mid Midwives Association of the Philippines, and currently she's taking her doctor, doctorate of philosophy in public health at the Kaohsiung Medical University in Taiwan, with a Type A scholarship. Live from Kaohsiung City, Taiwan, let's all welcome Ma'am Eva Felipe Dimog. Yes, ma'am, we can see your screen.
at that time and he was very homesick and when they came and found World University Ranking for Innovation or WURI, uh, and I I'm so happy that you really uh, prioritize research in one of your uh, programs. So I'm I'm so happy to be with you and to share my experiences. So my presentation would be focused on a theme: unwavering persistence and lacking the dissemination of vital knowledge from our study. So by Profession. I'm a midwife by profession and also a uh, uh, a teacher by profession. So I'm a faculty member of the nursing department here at Mountain Province State Polytechnic College here at Mountain Province um, Mountain, uh, in the Cordillera Administrative Region and also presently a doctoral student of uh, PhD in Public Health at Kaohsiung Medical University. So... I'm still a novice uh, researcher, so I'm still starting to, to learn about uh, research. But I'm happy to share with you, for those who are like me, who are still starting to learn about research and how to conduct and how to share uh, the findings of the research. Okay, so my sharing today would be, um, I will be sharing with you the experiences I had with my master's thesis at the University of the Philippines, Manila. And I would be sharing my experiences in submitting articles for publication, as well as the challenges, the experiences I experienced in sharing the results of my studies. And I would be uh, sharing with you some suggestions and some take home messages. So firstly, this, is my, this was my thesis when I had my master's. It's entitled Exploring the Perceptions of Women with Children Diagnosed to Have Birth Defects at the Baguio General Hospital and Medical Center. So with the title alone, this would mean that um, I, I deal with birth defect and the beliefs of the mothers <laughs> on how uh, it occurred. So this is a qualitative study that I have conducted with my supervisor. Okay, so um, so my the completion of my thesis was in 2016. However, even it's uh, it was completed in 2016. It uh, these are the highlights before it was completed. So I had my uh, it is in it was in 2015 when I had my defense for a uh, technical uh, clearance and then finally i had the ethics ethical approval after a few months by my school and another um, ethical clearance from from the baguio general hospital where i had to conduct my study after few months and then by february i i had to resubmit again for another ethical approval because there are suggestions committee of Baguio Gen, Baguio General Hospital for its improvement. So I had to revise again before it, it was finally approved in uh, February 2016. So just after its approval, I was already uh, collecting the data since uh, for, from February. So after that, I, I'd love to, to share the result of my studies. So we submitted to one journal, uh, three actually, but uh, unfortunately they were rejected. That was in 2017. So, but I persisted and submitted again to another two journal and uh, it was rejected again. And they said that it's not within the scope of the journal. And 
again in the next year 2019 i tried again to submit to another four journals but unfortunately it was rejected in 2020 i lose hope and i was discouraged and demotivated to publish anymore but uh, somehow in 2021 i i had the energy again to write again and submitted our our journal to the journal of community genetics which finally was published in 2022. So if you see the trend, I completed my thesis in 2016, but only after six years that was uh, 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 published in 2023. So in, I really want to share the results of my study because it's where I've learned that women with children diagnosed with birth defect perceive that birth defect is a cause of genetics or namamana, stress, fall during pregnancy, maternal sickness, teenage pregnancy, and thin uterine lining, as well as God's will. Now, if you say of the uh, most uh, most perceived belly beliefs on the causes of birth defects, it, it all uh, talks about the experiences of the mother. It's the mother who carried the baby for nine months. So they are the ones who are stressed, who may uh, met accident during the pregnancy when they fall, they, they are the ones who got sick. So all of them were experiences of mothers. Now, if they perceive that that was the one that caused their birth defect child, then they might feel guilt, guilty, and they blame. They might be blamed with the condition of their child. So um, they well believe. Healthcare providers, especially genetic counselors, can provide appropriate genetics education and psychosocial support to their client. Maybe if they will learn, if we conduct health education and uh, teach them that birth defects, 70% of the time, we do not know what have caused it, then they will they will feel um, better or they might the, the guilt in their uh, what they feel may be lessened because there are some explanation that that we can offer them and if they feel uh, blamed then we could offer them some psychosocial support they need so that's why i really wanted to share the result of this study another uh, study that uh, i conducted uh, this is when i i was already in kaohsiung medical university so I am an advocate of breastfeeding. So I conducted this uh, national study, a population-based cross-sectional study on initiation of breastfeeding one hour after birth. Now, um, this um, this one, I completed in November when this was during the COVID-19, which I, I was quarantined in a hotel. And so I had to take care uh, I had to do something worthwhile during my 21 days quarantine inside the hotel because we were not allowed to go out. So I had to do something. So I wrote this article and and, and completed it. And then um, the next few months, I I let my supervisor review uh, about the article. So there will be additional inputs, like what uh, Professor uh, the the uh, our first speaker who who I learned a lot when he shared his talk that we really need to collaborate with our supervisor. As a student, it's really important to work with our supervisor. So in February, uh, uh, the next year, we were able to submit to the first journal, but it was rejected. So we did not give up. We submitted to another journal. It was rejected again. In the next few months again, we we uh, submit to another journal, but it's rejected until finally we were able to submit to the Advanced Nursing Research Journal, wherein it was accepted for publication. Now, I really would like to share this one, this uh, study, because when you see literature, early breastfeeding initiation be, be within first hour from birth uh, is a critical step so that we will reduce neonatal mortality. It's, it's really important. So with, if we know the factors uh, of uh, why mothers does not initiate breastfeeding within the first hour from birth, then if we know this factor, we could uh, strategize how we promote it 
and uh, we can reduce uh, death among newborn. Now, we found in this study that it is best communicate uh, our uh, breastfeeding health education through printed mass media, especially in the Philippines that um, most of the pregnant women are using the prenatal card or the home-based mother's record. And um, we also found in this study that those cesarean section mothers has the difficulty to really breastfeed their babies for within one hour. So we recommend there that we need to support the mother who, who delivered cesarean section so that we will reduce the barriers to early breastfeeding initiation. Okay. So, um, so from 2021, it was only 2023 that we were able to publish our article on breastfeeding. Another, um, this is my third article I want to share with you. Um, we, uh, I, because I'm a midwife by profession, I would like to the experiences of midwives in the rural, in the rural areas of our country. So I focus my studies on professional midwives working in the rural communities or in the geographically isolated and depressed areas. So this one I conducted in March 2021. It was actually a requirement of one of my courses, uh, but I feel that it's, it's no use if you don't share it. So I really tried my best to write an, an article and tried to submit it for publication. So in March 2021, I completed the manuscript and tried to submit it for the first journal, that, but it was rejected. And the next few months, I tried to we tried to submit again, uh, but again, it was rejected. February, it was rejected again in the third journal. It was rejected again for the fourth journal in March 2022. Now, until I submitted this article to Acta Medica Filipina, where it was accepted for publication. So, um, the title of our uh, article became Roles and Functions of Rural Health Midwives in the Cordillera Administrative Region. So, it's a qualitative pilot study with at least uh, seven participants. I really uh, wanted to share the knowledge on this research because um, the roles and functions of midwives are not that explored in our country, yet they are the grassroots healthcare provider and the primary healthcare provider in the field. They provide all the programs of the Department of Health, but then their salary and their work work uh, environment is not yet upgraded. It's not yet uh, they are not yet taken care of with their with their working conditions. So I I want to elevate elevate the professional practice of my of my colleagues so through at least through writing i would contribute to the knowledge about um, these midwives their works okay for instance we found that not only maternal and child health that they are uh, providing but even beyond midwifery care midwifery role they are providing it like monitoring of blood pressure of the people in the community they even deliver even a bridge for those children who are in a sitting position during pregnancy, which are very risky. They also provide um, uh, suturing of minor cuts, which is it should be the doctors or the nurses, but it's being done by the by the midwives. They are also trying to do treatment of uh, uh, of adult and children's infection and diseases in the community. And giving medication and community and many more, in addition to what they're doing, like like uh like providing uh, malaria, dengue, leprosy, sanitation, and all other programs of the Department of Health. So uh they are really doing so much work. However, their uh the benefit and uh they are not uh, benefiting from what should be in uh that they should get proportional to what they are providing in their community. So I really would like uh, other professionals to learn on uh, the importance or the roles of midwives in the field. And we also recommend in this study that the league, the midwifery law should be reviewed and so that um, the salary standardization um, may be considered in, in the midwifery field. 
Okay, so there are other experiences that affected my uh, research writing and so in my research journey, we cannot go away with conflict of schedules with our academic supervisors. Um, our uh, supervisors or co-authors, it takes time for them to review our paper. And there is some interesting uh, experiences that I had that some of my co-authors critic the paper of uh, critic our paper rather than uh, contribute it or like serving as a co-author of the paper. And uh, when I submit uh, to journals, it takes six months or a year or more duration uh, before the journal reviewer would, would review the article. And somehow, if they, they give us the comment, sometimes the comments are very vague or unclear. And sometimes it's very mean comment. Like the reviewer would just say, the authors have blindly accepted the reviewer's comment without considering whether the comments are valid. But however, when I see her comments, it's where in the article, uh, what she mean, and um, maybe it's just me who, who found this, uh, this uh, a vague comment. Uh, and I received some other mean comments, but I couldn't share it with you because maybe I, I deleted it or somewhere. And... Uh, some reviewers also would uh, recommend unrelated suggestion to our students. Um, and some also are very angry in their comments. And most of the time, our submitted papers will be rejected, which is very normal in the research community. And some reviewers would not give suggestion for the improvement of the paper. They will just say reject. Okay, so somehow it's so uh, disappointing at times. Okay, so research writing and publishing is really challenging uh, and we can feel uh, discouraged and demotivated along the way. And it, it is time consuming and can steal your me time, can result to sleep deprivation also, and lack of time with your friends as well as with your families. Okay. So as a researcher, we are very passionate with um, in sharing our findings so that others may learn from our result. However, based on my experiences as a newbie or a starting researcher, here are some of my suggestions. While waiting, just while waiting for the review of other journals or paper, just keep writing and share our findings to the academic community. And just keep conducting more studies and be positive and always collaborate and ask our academic supervisors and mentors for guidance or for further recommendation where we can publish our paper. How, and also just be mindful that be careful from the predatory online research conference and be careful in submitting your abstract to or full paper to predatory journal and publishers. It's, it's really good to check online first the lists of these journals before we will submit. So uh, we check before we submit our article, which we really put our mind and, and heart to it. Uh, I am telling you this because I experienced to, to, uh, to, to participate in a, an online predatory journal, a predatory uh, webinar. Uh, I'm a victim of that and they took my money of uh, by, by because I used my uh, ATM to pay for the registration, but just just re recently that I am learning about these possibilities. If you see this uh, certificate, it, it it's at, at a glance, it's it's really not. I presented my paper in this article, but during the conference online, they the there is no good moderator. They they do not. Um, really have a good uh, layout of the conference and then many are absent and my certificate looks like this okay so I, I, I was wondering why there is no signature so I sent an email uh, to request a signature but it just came so there's no they just just uh, just put a what's this um, 
is still write the, num the name of the organizer. So I learned that this one is not a legit webinar. So I hope you will not repeat the same mistake I did. And also I, I was able, my co-author one time submitted our paper to a predatory journal and they were asking for um, thousands of uh, money to pay for the publication, yet they did not have a review of our paper. Those are signs that they are predatory. And so my my supervisor at the time expressed her frustration. And since then, I am very, very careful. But uh, we did not submit to that uh, predatory journal. And thank God, we were not able to publish our paper with that. Okay. So um, there are many challenges in research. So to survive uh, this academic uh, we need really mentors for our research endeavor. So I I treat my thesis advisor during my master's days, Dr. Leonardo Aristacio. He is a professor in Dean of College of Arts and Sciences. And uh, he it was him who who made me love qualitative research because we were the one who, who conducted the beliefs on the causes of birth defects. And this is uh, Dr. Carmen Sita Pedelia, also a chancellor and professor. Um, I treat him as my mentor because she was the one who made us love to contribute our research findings because it will impact policy and improvement of health programs of the country. And uh, just recently, I had Dr. Fu Liang, my supervisor at Kaohsiung Medical University. It's her whom I learned how to do national data analysis or big data analysis where we can learn from. So we have a national context of a research topic we, we, we are conducting. She is a biostatistician, but uh, her, her field of studies is on maternal and child. So that's why I was able to work with her until today. So we really need our mentors to help us in our research journey, okay? So my take-home messages for those who are starting researchers like me in research, disappointments and discouragements are normal. We just try to keep going in sharing our knowledge through writing and publication of our paper because our documented record is a contribution to the field for future generation. And through our research, we can inspire and guide the next generation of researchers. Like our uh, first speaker who, who really loved to publish her paper so that other researchers can learn from our uh, knowledge that we share. And publication is a way to promote the scientific integrity and transparency of our research method and findings. And our reporting will enhance the research credibility that allows other researchers to replicate and build upon previous researchers. And through publication, we could reach global audiences such as other scholars, practitioners, policymakers that will pave the way uh, to internationalize, internationalize research. Just remember, we cannot do research alone. Each of us has our own research interests and ex expertise. Collaboration and partnership are crucial in helping one another to complete a research endeavor. I really love our first speaker whom I, I, I'm inspired again to continue doing research uh, and to, to partner and collaborate with other researchers. Uh, thank you so much, uh, University of Makati. And thank you for all the audience who have uh, patiently listening to my experiences. Thank you, thank you so, so much. much. Thank you very much, Ma'am Eva Dimog, for uh, gracing uh, your presence here in our sixth research congress. First, um, it was wonderful to hear from you again uh, after personally seeing you in Taiwan. It's uh, great of you to come join us today. I do believe there are questions, so um, for those of you who are joining us online, please don't hesitate to put it in the chat box. And uh, for those of us who are physically here, I didn't get to mention this during the first round of the Q&A, but for added incentive, our uh, CUR team would also be giving out bamboo USBs and uh, bamboo pens, correct? So kindly look for uh, Mark. 
Sir Mark from the CUR so that you could also receive it for added incentive. Not like you needed to earlier because there were a lot of questions in queue. So, um, right. Um, do we have brave souls who are uh, going to ask questions or do we give them time to chat? put it in the chat box? But uh, thank you, Ma'am Eva, for keeping it real, uh, for the courage to share that... Uh, Indeed, like all uh, thesis writing or all writing in general, there would really be um, moments or situations that uh, you'd face rejection. So that gives us um, a mental preparation, so to speak, uh, for, for any struggle that we would have to just persevere. I think if, uh, regardless of whether it's public health or whatever discipline they would... Uh, uh, venture on. It's really the perseverance that uh, is the main takeaway from your talk. Okay, so we do have questions. Please introduce yourselves. Sorry, everyone's pointing to me in several directions. Uh, there we go. Go ahead, sir. Good morning, Ma'am Eva. Uh, thank you for Good morning. for shedding light to everyone here in the forum. Uh, it's very admirable that your virtue of persistence really paid off. And it's very commendable and such an inspiration for all of us, especially people like me who's at its first year in graduate studies. Uh, my question is regarding your predicament or your situation about the predatory publication research fora that you've had. What do you think should be uh, be done by the academe, by, by research uh, institutions, so that there would be a safeguard so that uh, there won't be any more victims of, of uh, researchers presenting and submitting to predatory publications. Thank you and stay safe. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I am really ashamed to share with you my experiences of submitting to predatory journal. It's just that I'm very eager to, to, to share what we found from our studies so that other uh, uh, healthcare providers or other researchers will learn from them. But I think be very careful. And also, our, I think in every university or state colleges, when you go to your research uh, department, they have the list of, of journals who are uh, uh, passively, potentially predatory. So you can ask help from the research department of your school because they have the list. They have the list. Because during accreditation, they are screening the, um, I think they are screening the published, uh, published papers of the professors or instructors and they would check the journal if it's within the within the list of the research who are uh, predatory then they would exclude it from the points of the professor who are applying for promotion that could be a way um, and also you can also check online if you just type uh, predatory journals the bills uh, there is bills list and you would see a lot of journals, even lists of uh, uh, publishers, uh, you can see there. And if, uh, if they are collecting money uh, without them giving you the reviews, and what they are asking is very expensive, those are be predatory journals and predatory um, predatory conferences. So it's really good to collaborate with our research department and to make sure they are not within the lists of uh, uh, supposed to be or those predatory journals. There are journals that were not predatory before, but now pre became predatory. So they evolve also. So there are years that they are predatory and there are years they are not. So we check them every now and then. Even we say they are not predatory, but we have to check another updated list online or with our college department. I think that's what we can do for now. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I Thank hope you. I answered your query. Yes, very much, because it's very uncertain, especially at this time, that all of us, because we wanted to 
showcase our academic Project. prowess. So that's why at times we fail to to gauge whether is this a legal repository or is it just another scam? Because red flags are everywhere, even in the academe research. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you also. I think they are also using my name in a predatory journals. So, but uh, I don't include them in my in my um, Google Scholar profile. So, if you know it's a predatory, do not include them in your application for promotion or or whatnot because it's it's not good in, um, in our uh, to show our credibility. Thank you so much. We have another question. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, Prof. Eba. Um, before I um, ask my question, I'm really glad that you mentioned about the ethical consideration process that you undergone in your paper. Because in our university, we start uh, having committee. We call that UMREKPO. So that's uh, my question is... Oh, sir, before you proceed with the question, if you don't mind, please introduce yourself for Mom Eva's benefit. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, hi, Mama Eva. I'm Mr. Jun Lorsi Daxa the first from higher school ng Yuma, a senior high school ah. department. Uh, my question is... Um, how will you encourage the people in the academy, especially students in the basic education in our university to publish paper or their work? How can we or how can we be equipped in doing that uh, study to avoid intimidation or feel na baka mahirap yan gawin? Uh, thank you. Um, really hard. Even me, I don't know. I don't know everything. So collaboration is uh, nice because other researcher will know something else, but we don't know. So we partner together. So whatever we know, we share. What we don't know, we we learn from them. Um, I I understand from your point of view that we are intimidated also by other researchers that would bluff up along the way. Uh, did you know this? Did you know that? That we were frightened to do it? Maybe just do it and submit. Because we do not learn when we do not submit. It's the journal that will tell us uh, what's wrong or what we can improve with our paper. Just don't give up. If it's rejected, then it's normal. Submit again. If rejected, submit again. Uh, and be humble that we don't know everything. And, you know, a uh, reviewer of the journals uh, will share you their knowledge also where we can learn from. So I also understand uh, from an author point of view that if we are rejected, we feel I, I really cry a lot, you know, uh, it's, it's really hard. We need to graduate. We need, we need like this, like that, because it's a requirement. But but. Uh, over that, I really wanted to share. So if your passion is you want to share the knowledge you have discovered in your research, then just write and publish, and then submit, write, publish, uh, revise, uh, submit. Um, we don't know, uh, just, just, uh, just go on. And uh, like having a horse uh, eye like this, just, just focus on our goal. Um, don't mind people around who would uh, give you discouragement. Yeah, I experienced that. I'm being intimidated. But if we love what we do, I think we can do many things and it's possible. We can learn from reviewers and the journals. Just not be dismayed and be persistent. I, uh, I, I have other uh, research now that I did. So I can or more. Many rejections, uh, left and right. But I still just just do just do what they say and then revise and then submit. Yeah, uh, yeah, and enjoy life. Enjoy being a knowledge producer. Yeah, that's how I call it. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for Prof. Ev. Uh, I'm, I'm not yet a professor. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, uh, Ma'am Eva and Professor uh, Jun Lor. Uh, we do have one more question online, I believe. So this will be flashed uh, through your screen, Ma'am Eva. I hope you can see it. But for the benefit of everyone, where can you draw the line, the need of healthcare research, and uh, address the survival of a neophyte researcher as a researcher in the industry? Am I correct in getting that? As a researcher in this industry, where do you draw the line, the need of healthcare research and how to address the survival of a neophyte researcher? I think I treat myself, I see myself as a neophyte, a novice researcher. And um, it's just in 2019 or 2020 that I was able to or 2021 that I was able to publish my first perspective paper. So with that perspective paper, I was, I was really happy because I, I became in my early 30s. That's the time I was able to publish. So I think I am a late bloomer in research. And until now, I'm still learning. I think um, the motivator of me to do research and to share it through publication is my love to share the knowledge I discover from, from my studies. There, I treat research as there's no money in research. Although if you are given reward in, in a money form or financial form, it, it's a thank you. But if, if we share the results of our studies, and it will be the basis of other healthcare professionals to better the healthcare they, they provide to the patient and to their client, then it would be good. One of my perspective paper, the first one I, I wrote is about compliance on iron folic acid supplementation. In the Philippines, many women, pregnant women, come to us for prenatal checkup when they are already five months pregnant six months pregnant or worse they are delivering their baby before they come to the hospital or to the clinic so the critical period of first trimester first three months they did not take the iron they did not take the multivitamins they did not have their uh, tetanus toxoid so the baby's uh, risk to have health uh, health condition sickness like low birth weight uh, birth defect uh, death premature birth stillbirth and other conditions are increased because they were not able to receive iron and folic acid supplements. They are, they are late going to the health center. So I thought of a, a policy paper. So I wrote an article on that and it was published in the Philippine Journal of Science. It's a multidisciplinary journal of our country. So I was able to put there the problems. Why? One is healthcare provider were not able to they, are, uh, they have the low capability to, to help educate and do counseling. Maybe if the health educator will explain to the pregnant women that the first, pre first trimester or first three months, it's where the brain is developed, it's where the heart is developed, the vital organs are developed, the heart, the spine, and the brain, the skull, and we need iron there. And if we take the iron, then birth defect iron and folic acid birth defect are prevented uh, low birth weight are prevented and uh, walang na kunti ang mamamatay na mga bata uh, uh, prevent natin ang mga yun the midwives our pregnant women and in the long run ang mga bata na to take an iron uh, na mga, mga nanay na nag-take ng iron, mas matatalino sila in their later later part in life because of their academic performance are better than those uh, children who did, that the, their mother did not take iron and fall it during pregnancy. If we give them the facts, the benefits, and all of this stuff, uh, all of this uh, uh, benefit of the programs, and it's free, the iron and folic acid is free given to women. However, why are not they taking it? So in my perspective paper, I suggested the ways on how healthcare provider improve the program. So 
be friendly in, in giving in giving uh, and then shorten the line the queue during the health checkup and do the uh, reminders bill count during home visit so all of these things i i was able to write in my perspective paper in the hope that our healthcare provider improve how we provide healthcare to our client i think my passion is as for better healthcare in the simple way i know as a midwife or as a healthcare provider i think that's the line we can meet the love of sharing the knowledge and also for the betterment of our community uh, using our discipline where we are at now i think uh, that's that's how i see it thank you Thank you once again, Ma'am Eva. And thank you for your round thank of applause, you. of course, for our second speaker. Um, we do have to uh, cut the Q&A short, Ma'am Eva, in the interest of time. But if you do have questions that you would still want to ask our speaker, please send it through CUR. And I know that they would love to forward it to Ma'am Eva. And uh, also on this note, we would like to uh, present the Certificate of Appreciation to you, Ma'am Eva. So please allow me to read, even though you will be virtually accepting this for the meantime. The University of Makati would like to give the Certificate of Appreciation to uh, Ma'am Eva Felipe Dimog for the invaluable knowledge imparted as resource speaker during the 6th Research Congress with the theme Achieving Global Excellence through Institutional Synergy, conducted on October 11 and 12, 2023 at the University of Makati, given this 11th day of October, 2023. Signed, uh, Alex Sorci Ramos, PhD, Cese, Florante E. De Los Santos, RGC, Maria Faye Nanette, M. Cariaga, RPH, MSPH, PhD. Once again, thank you very much, Ma'am Eva Felipe Dimog. Thank you so much, University of Makati. I'm excited to visit your school, maybe in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, and looking forward to uh, meeting you again in person, Ma'am Eva, and uh, good luck for your for, uh, studies. Our next speaker is a BS graduate of chemical engineering from Fiat University. He finished his Master of Applied Science in Food Engineering at the University of New South Wales, Australia. He worked at the food safety section of the DOSD Industrial Technology De Development Institute as a senior science research specialist. In 2012, he became the program manager of the food safety unit of DOSD NCR until his retirement last 2022. Currently, he is a consultant for DOSD NCR and serves as a trainer and resource person for technical consultancy activities. Let us please welcome Engineer Rogelio B. Prospero. But <laughs> we're leaving lunch. So please bear with me. Eh? Na na kayo. <laughs> so our topic is about research proposal writing. I have stripped the topic to the basic. Very basic siguro. Yung iba baka mabor yung ating mga postgrad na ano, mga students na. So baka ma mabor kayo. So for the undergraduates, this is uh, where, where to start? We have to start the basic. Okay. 
<laughs> you mock, we have a problem. <laughs> Our topic is about uh, research proposal writing. Ito us usually ang Waterloo nung ibang mga students. Kasi yung iba, magaling mag-research. Pero they lack the skills to write. So, our, the outline of the presentation is, what is a research proposal? How do you get to it? What is the generic? Format. It will de depend upon the requirements, no? And what a proposal must answer. Then the review process. How is it reviewed? Then uh, why sometimes it is rejected or is not approved? And uh, the aesthetic checklist for the hard copies that you will uh, present. And what makes successful research proposals? And what are the tools you can use to make your proposal successful? Let's start with the definition. What is a research proposal? So a research proposal is a factual, formal, and persuasive. Emphasis on persuasive. Huh? You have to convince uh, a description of a course of action uh, or set of recommendations just written as a document to solicit funding or access to resources for the conduct of an activity or the implementation of a research study. Actually, three, uh, the purpose of a proposal is threefold. You have to persuade, you have to inform, and motivate for undergraduates, your uh, superior, your advisor, and the uh, uh, who will try to approve your proposal. So, in, uh, in writing proposals, you have to have funds to conduct your research. So, and otherwise, you don't have the resources to implement it. Now, what does a proposal should answer number one what is the problem you are going to solve that is the basic what are you trying to solve what how are you going to solve the problem this this is in the methodology that you would use and what exactly will you provide for sponsors so human nature what do I get out of it no so you benefit then next is, can you deliver your promise? Can you? Are you qualified enough? And how long? For how long? Next, what benefits can you offer? Is your search, research going to benefit? Is there anything? May katuturan ba? O malaking pakinabang ng pupulot sa gagawin yung research? Then, when will you complete the work? How long? What are the activities involved? Can you accomplish them in time? And the last and most important, how much will it cost? What are the resources that you would need to implement it? The expenses? Is it commensurate to activities? Maraming nagpo-propose sa DOST. No? Pero kalimitan, yung kanilang line item budget is to acquire some uh, technical equipment na hindi naman magagamit mabuti doon sa research. So, uh, ang nangyayari, nare-reject siya. Now, this is the generic format of a proposal. Of course, you have an abstract. But then, abstract, the problem statement or the background, the methods and procedures, the qualifications, uh, resources, the work schedule, the gun chart, and budget. Importante yung budget, ah. The bibliography, what are your references, and yung appendices that you would use. Uh, writing a proposal, you first of course you have to identify your research topic. You have to be specific. Uh, a lot of the 
researchers start with a very generic motherhood statement na title. So, ang nangyayari, napaka-broad. You have to be very specific on the title. What uh, particular, for example, a topic, what particular aspect of that topic are you going to focus on? Next, you conduct a literature review. How do you uh, determine the background for your research? Uh, that, then you have defined the research problem. Is there a problem based on your literature review? How extensive is your literature review? Hindi pwedeng skimming, skimming lang tayo sa uh, mga nababasa natin. You have to read and you have to skim, uh, get the gist out of what you have read. And of course, you have to re uh, formulate your research objectives. You develop your research questions. You design a research methodology. I hope that UMAX uh, curriculum has a very strong in research methodology. Then you design, uh, you identify the challenges and establish the research significance. How important would this research, what would be its contribution to the advancement of science, technology, and, inform uh, and innovation. Next, is you, out you outline your timeline. How long can you accomplish what you are proposing? Uh, of course, the research question, you ask questions what, why, and how. So that it will provide you a summary of the proposal and the literature review. What are, have been done on the topic? What are available literature? Now, wha, how did this stud, previous studies pair in terms of uh, uh, have they de determined actually what they have proposed to determine? Then methodology. You have to have a good research design, uh, research procedures, uh, collection of procedures, uh, selection and access. If you have human uh, subject review, you have to do some, you have to pass to the ethics board. If you have some, uh, and of course the importance, preliminary data, you have to analyze what. Does your data support what you uh, are uh, have proposed? And the most important statement of limitations. What would be the scope of your study? Then, conclusion. What is the importance? What are the major contributions? Again, uh, going back, we say that a doc, uh, proposal is a document that sells an idea. You suggest a way of solving a problem and it is written in a technical way, using technical writing skills. So it's important that you try to hone your skills in technical writing. And you must be continuously, as a proponent or writer, write, revise, revise, revise. It cannot be single drop of uh, the end, of course, uh, you have to get feedback from your colleagues. Pwede ba yun? Kasi medyo nagiging secretive na baka daw maagaw yung idea, yung concept, kapag nagko-consult with other colleagues. So, uh, it depends upon kung sino yung colleagues nyo. And of course, you have to solicit guidance from any sponsor or funding agency that you would submit your proposal. Again, persuasive writing is the uh, bottom line in proposal writing. Now, the proposals must be informative. It should educate the reader. Not, not only to, kailangan meron lang ma-present para maka-comply uh, with my academic requirements. So, no, dapat merong, you have to convince your reader to do or act, to do or provide support. You have to make your... Uh, Reader believe that the solution is practical and appropriate. 
and it is through the logic and reason and approach taken in the solution. Now, the summary or abstract, uh, again, a summary is the gist of, what you, the, of your research or proposal. Abstract is when you have completed your research proposal. You have to summarize the concept, the framework, summarize the important information from the proposal, anticipate concerns, and project what particular problem that you did with your uh, proposal elicit and what opportunities there for improving, improving things. And, of course, you have to write it last. When you have already completed your uh, proposal or you have completed your research. This is a summary of uh, how to write a summary uh, guide from the English as a second language.com. We're not going to details of that. And how to write a, an abstract. What do reviewers look for uh, your research? A doable project. Should be a reasonable use of resources and a practical approach to the problem. Yeah, hindi pwedeng suntok sa buwan. Hindi pwedeng imposible. So dapat merong kahihin at, at magagawa ba? Possible ba? Practical. Okay, next. Is it worth doing? Does the benefit outweigh the cost? Meron ba siyang contribution for advancing science and technology? Meron bang mapupulot? Merong magagamit at the end of the as of, upon completion of the project. Then, is it systematic and logical development ng ideas? Is it easily read? Madali bang basahin? For proposal, accessible by proposal, do you have a PDF copy to provide to the reviewers or a hard copy? You, what are the major reasons for rejection? Number one, Mechanical reasons. You did not meet the deadline of submission. Number two, you did not follow, strictly follow the format required. Number three, you have incomplete or unclear descriptions of one or more elements. Number four, highly partisan positions on issues. Is, it, is your proposal politically correct or does it uh, evokes gender sensitivity? And number five is writing quality. Sabi nga ng uh, one of the writers, no, si, uh, have mercy on your reader. Technical na nga yung ano, mahirap misan intindihin, tapos uh, hirap pang uh, mapalo yung train of thought nyo. And of course, carelessness and inattention to detail. Uh, methodological reasons, lack of originality. No? Background search nyo, literature review, nagawa na ba yan? Are there no duplications? Are you not reinventing the wheel? Next, methodology is not appropriate for the purpose. You're trying to collect data na hindi na magagamit yung methodology na pinili nyo. Personal reasons, the proponent is not uh, familiar with the field, outside of his field of expertise, or it is uh, unqualified to perform the work because he had no relevant or related experience in the, uh, the field. Next is your cost benefit. Possible, your proposal is not within the funding agency's priority. It has unrealistic budget unjustifiable proposed acquisitions. Kaya na nabanggit ko kanina, you are proposing, dapat yung acquisition nyo makakatulong doon sa gagawin yung research. And cost is out of proportion, bloated. Napakalaki ng budget, tapos ang magiging benefit, napakaliit. Uh, aesthetic checklist lang naman to for your hard copy that you will submit, of course. Uh, is there table of contents, title page, may summary ba, may organization, organized ba siya, consistent bang margins, pagination ba is uh, uh, accurate, you use the, the proper, the consistent types and style, 
font type and size ng ano ng uh, typeface is uh, if you're going to reproduce it to copies is it clear and properly collated no lalo na kung marami magre-review tapos hindi properly collated magkakaroon ng problem na na did you narrate the footnote properly cross referencing and to use color coding for color coded sections did you uh, avoid unnecessary charge tables and float diagrams? Baka hindi naman kailangan andoon. So, pampadami lang para lang kumapal yung inyong proposal. Has it been uh, reviewed for spelling, grammar, and diction? Diction. diction kasi, when you say, is it American English? Is it British? Is it Australian English? Ang pinapalo nyo. So, may mga... Uh, nuances or different, slight difference yeah. Has it been, uh, is it accurate? Are there no typographical errors as much as possible? So, meron naman tayong spell check, di ba? So, word meron. Are the section headings clear and consistent with the format? Summary tips, number one. Know your target audience. Who are you writing for? Learn as much. Kung meron kung funding agency, you are submitting your proposal to a funding agency. Ano yung research priorities? Ano yung submission procedures? Ano yung prepared proposal formats? And what are their advocacies? Number two, again, PT your readers. Make your proposal as readable as possible. Get to the point. Do not circumlocution, no? paikot-ikot, paligoy-ligoy, straight to the point. And present it clearly and logically. So, clarity and conciseness is the one. So, hashtag K-I-S-S-S. Are you familiar with that? <laughs> Keep it short and simple, stupid. <laughs> Of course, you have to avoid grammar and typo errors as much as possible. Then, avoid too much technical jargon. Masyadong technical, yung technical na nga yung proposal nyo. Tapos, paano makakasabay uh, yung babasa? So, you have to avoid the technical jargon as much as possible. If you cannot avoid it, you add a glossary. No, para, what, the, what, are you mean, what do you mean by that? Of course, you have to write to express, not to impress. And you have to shun yung legalist. Legalist, you're writing like a lawyer. Yung tema ng inyong mga wordage is parang lawyer. Then say what you mean and mean what you say. Are you familiar with Webster? Are you familiar with Rogets? <laughs> Are you familiar with Frank and White style manual? You have to look at this. And number three, edit, edit, edit. You have to recorrect correct it again and again. So it's not as open as to, you have to make it uh, as readable as possible to get your message effectively and successfully. Uh, one technique now is to leave your uh, manuscript drop uh, behind for three, three days. Do not look at it, do not bother with it. After three days, you review it again. Then you will see you have to, you have a lot of improvements that you can introduce. This is a sample of a, a page from the uh, how uh, to shun your era uh, legalism. For example, uh, you don't say a large number of, just say many. Diba simple? Humaba lang yung, para humaba lang yung sentence. And a lot of uh, sinasabi natin word diarrhea. Masyadong maraming words. Ang, yun lang naman ang ibig sabihin. So, go to the point. Tumukin ka agad. Ano ba yung tools na pwede natin? Let's just start with, with uh, what is research? Research is uh, uh, you, what you undertake to find out things in systematic way. To increase your knowledge. Systematic way is based on logical relationships and just not just beliefs. 
You find out things. What you aim at, you explain, you criticize, you analyze. And it's much to answer the research question. Another way of saying is that research is a gamble. No? To find something that may or may not work. So, hindi tayo, uh, ano, kaya nga research, kung hindi, kung hindi kayo magre-research, alam na yan, pack na yan. Diba? No, uh, pre, uh, prior knowledge na yan. Of course, development, you exploit what can be developed under that research. You can, you can be either a product, consumer good or gadget, a process, cost efficient manufacturing, shortcut, easier, simpler way to do, or a system policy, improvement on existing method, time and effort, resource saving, modification. So, ito yung uh, product ng development. Of course, you have to apply the scientific method. What is the scientific method? You ask a question, do background research, you construct a hypothesis, you test an with an experiment, uh, is the procedure working, yes or no, then go back to test with an to modify that, you analyze the data and draw conclusions, you align with hypotheses. And uh, results align partially as not at all with hypotheses. So then you communicate what you have found out. So I think components na research course may own purpose. Then in your search strategy, you do literature survey. You choose a topic, you find background information, the topic good, you find materials. Napakaswerte yung ngayon generation. One click lang, you have access to information. Hindi kayo katulad ako na baby boomer. You have to go to the library, maghalughog sa card catalog, magbubungkal ng mga ma, <laughs> maalikabok na libro. So, napakaswerte nyo. So, kailangan gamitin nyo yun. Yung, kaya nga sinasabi natin, internet is the information highway. When was it born? You know, when officially born ang internet? 1994. Some of you, some, maybe some of you are not yet born. 1994. So, do nag-start yung internet. So, you have to locate, evaluate, and take notes. So, you have to review. Pag ang review nyo, di ba, sabi nga ni, uh, ni Brad Pitt, di ba, sa dating doon, basa. Pero magbasa, dapat iintindihin yung binabasa nyo. Then, before you can write your background or introduction. Then, there is difference from uh, research methods and methodology. The research method, usually, the methods imply, uh, used and how the methodology, how is it used by the researcher? There are different types of research. You have basic and applied research. So depending upon your, you have a depth of scope, you have exploratory, you have descriptive, you have exploratory, you have qualitative and quantitative, you have uh, deductive and inductive research, you have primary research and secondary research. So to depend upon which now, the most important in your literature survey is to identify the research gap in your readings. What has not been answered? What has been not been proven? So sometimes you find that in all the existing research, outdated na ba siya? Is it time to upgrade the research? So research gap is uh, usually seven of them. Evidence gap, is it... Uh, uh, the conclusions are drawn, is it still valid? Knowledge gap, meron bang hindi uh, talaga nag exist pero nag-conclude? Practical knowledge, professional na, uh, nag-deviate ba yung ano, ginagamit na ano, current practices? Methodology gap, variation in research methods is to generate insights to avoid distorted findings. So, na, na, na filter ba? na uh, refine yung method, methods. Empirical gap. Research findings or propositions are uh, need to be evaluated or empirically verified. Theoretical gap. 
theoric should not be applied to a certain research issues to generate new insights. Population gap. Research regarding the population that is not adequately. Kung kulang, kulang yung sampling. Pag gano'n, meron tayong population gap. Now, how do you search Google like a pro? Do you use quotation marks to refine yung sinesearch nyo? Do you use uh, dashes? Do you use tilde? Do you use side? All on? Do you have vertical bar? Or do you have two periods? Parang ellipsis, no? So, literature de data database, you can use this. All subject database. So, there's a lot of... Uh, Databases that you can use, medical, engineering, and uh, social science. Now, comparison of preferences in research. What are acceptable, sometimes acceptable, and rarely acceptable? Acceptable are the peer-reviewed journals. Scholarly books with uh, original work. Reports. Uh, from respected organizations like the UN, doctoral dissertations, or uh, masteral. Sometimes it's yung mga respected magazines, you can use them. Textbooks, without original work, of course, newspaper articles, you can use them. They are sometimes uh, acceptable. Websites or blogs, encyclopedias, dictionaries. Rarely acceptable, yung, yung mga favorite ng mga students, Wikipedia, <laughs> Wikidebate, kasi Wikipedia is not uh, that uh, accurate. So, personal and corporate website, so, you, that. Now, what you, ang basis nyo ba, ano ba? Ang basis nyo, pwede gamitin yung ating harmonized national R&D agenda. Dapat naka-pattern within this yung inyong research. So, meron under that, ano ba yung ambition 2040? Based na uh, pillars yan, malasakit, pagbabago yung kaunuran. Under that, yung ating National Integrated Basic Research Agenda, yung NIBRA. It, uh, it's on health, agriculture, aquatic and natural resources, industry, energy, and emerging technology, disaster risk reduction, and climate change adaptation. Meron tayong uh, specific na harmonized national R&D agenda. Maraming topics yan. So your research could fall with, uh, any, within any of these categories. Para merong, uh, ibig sabihin, kung mag-research kayo, merong patutunguhan. Merong ano. Kasi dati kasi pag nag-research, nagiging ang nangyayari, yung thesis, uh, naka, nakapile lang. No? Inaalikabukan lang. Hindi nagagamit yung information na nag-gather. Now, how do you manage your researches as students? Focus on a specific topic. Limit the scope and the range of coverage. And use your institution's R&D agenda or yung national harmonized uh, research and development agenda. You set your limits. Kapag uh, nag, kung experimental yung inyong uh, research, dapat maganda yung experimental design. Uh, a software that you can use as design expert para malimit yung, uh, so yung number of experiments that you do. At merong kaakibat na yan kagad na, experiment, uh, na statistical analysis. Of course, you have to assess your resources. Saan ba meron at, saan, at magkano? So you have to be resourceful. Then you search for the simplest method uh, to avoid duplication. Meron na bang nagawang ganyan? Pa paano? So yung mga uh, analytical man uh, manuals so pwedeng magamit dyan. Of course, you have to analyze your results statistically. Otherwise, hindi magiging valid yung inyong end conclusion that you will draw. And, of course, present your results uh, properly using uh, proper use ng graphs and tables. 
Ano bang question po? Sino bang wala na siguro senior student, senior high school dito, no? Ano difference between a teacher and a professor? Oh, this is just a, an, an anecdote, no? So, a professor daw is, uh, teachers are usually evaluated based on learning outcomes. If you do not, pa, uh, based on a, a written examination, standardized test, if you do not pass that, ibig sabihin, hindi effective yung inyong teacher, nag-fail siya as a teacher. But then, as the university, the professor, ginag-guide lang kayo. O, oh, dito pwede makuha yung information. Pero pa, paano nyo gagamitin yung, yung, yung privilege or yung, yung uh, access nyo to that information, how extensively and how limited you would use that is nasa sa inyo. These are just formats of uh, the DOST research proposal that uh, we, are, we require. And these are the R&D programs that uh, the DOST research and development uh, agenda is focused. Poverty alleviation and inclusive growth, climate change mitigation and adaptation, and disaster risk reduction. Now, pagka nag-propose kayo within that, uh, ano ba yung expect ng DOST na outputs? Number one, publication. As much as possible, publication. Kasi sa academic world, it's publish or perish. Diba? Kapag wala kayong na-produce na, na publication, nababawasan yung inyong, hindi matatagdagan yung inyong credentials. Number two is patent. Yung bang research nyo is patentable. Ay, is it entitled to intellectual property? Then, what is the product? Usable by your project? Is it commercial? Then, people and services. Meron ba kayo na natulungan na tao yung, yung, yung research? At meron bang services na mapaprovide? Next, yung places and partnership. So, partnership between higher education institutions and uh, uh, state college universities and state universities and colleges. And of course, you can have uh, policies, policies that can support policies para ma-improve yung. So, it's mostly socio-economic impacts ng inyong project. So, this is a guide of how you have to develop your ano, topic. Uh, is it narrowed down or focused to a specific job? So, what? Why? Rational or reason to justify the conduct of the proposed project based on the need to accomplish set objectives. Kailangan uh, backed up siya ng background check, background uh, literature survey. Next, methodology, outlined methods. Kung meron kailangan ng ethical research protocol for human or animal experimental studies, standard test and analysis. By whom? Sino yung mga mag uh, conduct are they qualified? So, paano nyo uh, yung uh, delineation at yung distribution ng uh, duties and responsibilities? Who and what? Budgetary requirements. Sa DOST, uh, nire-require na pag nag-propose kayo, line item budget. Specifically, what are going to be acquired? What are going to be the expenses? So, Pag halimbawa, uh, under the umbrella na UMAC, ano yung counterpart funding na to provide na UMAC? Next, when? How are you going to accomplish When are you going to accomplish it? How long? So, dapat yung work plan and schedules and contingency plan. Dapat meron kayong... Kapag hindi nag-work ito, ano yung... Dapat kung meron kayong plan A, meron kayong plan B. Hanggang plan C. Next, yung references. Of course, yung references nyo should be properly cited. No? Yung uh, nire-recommend ay yung uh, APA, American Psychological Association format, or yung Modern Language Association of America, ang format ng pag sa Then, proponents qualification. Ano bang qualification ng proponent? Or in that case, kung meron kayong advisor, ano yung... Uh, Ano yung relevant education niya? BS, graduate or postgraduate degree, trainings and experience, and previous R&D projects na na 
complete. Now, paano natin na-determine yung success ng research proposal? So, successful uh, project proposal would depend upon, number one, is yung project, proponents, competence, and track record. Ano na ba nagawa nyo? Ano na accomplish na nagpo-propose? Ito yung tinitignan sa DOST, ah, na nag-review. Next is yung cost-benefit value. Ano ba yung mapapala? Ano yung mapupulot? Ano yung mapapakinabangan sa magiging research nyo? And third is yung nagsusupport ba kayo ng, R, ng uh, R&D agenda ng ano, supporting agency? Is it aligned to the advocacy and current programs? Overall, kasi eh, ito yung nangyayari sa R&D natin. So, yung policy, technology, and education ang nagsusupport dyan. Policy, dependent sa trade agreements ng uh, Pilipinas. Sa trade requirements. Ano yung industry-driven needs? Nagsasurvey ba kayo? Ano yung needs ng industry na siyang dapat maging topic ng research ng estudyante? Then, uh, ano yung mga laws na magde-determine? Ano regulations? Meron bang credit in Pinas? Pwede ko bang iutang yung ano para ma-acquire tong technology na to? And ano yung investment incentives na mapapala? And of course, yung kultura. Ano ba yung kultura ng Pinoy? May, may maraming negative na ano, culture-based na ano, okay na yan, pwede na yan. <laughs> pwede na yan, hindi naman nila alam. <laughs> Ganon. So, and politics, of course. Ito, napakahirap na problema natin. Politics. Pag pinakakong politics sa ano, nasisira. <laughs> of course, technology, state of the art yan. Ano ba yung available na? Na hindi nyo na kailangan ulit-ulitin pa. Ando na, meron na available na gano'n, gano'n na nagagawa niya, ano ang capability niya. Ano yung processes niya, ano, meron na equipment, may materials na may available. Ang importante lang dyan, ano yung magiging cost ng licensing ng intellectual property niya. Sa education naman, relevant ba yung curriculum? Ano yung training programs that are you going to support yung curriculum? Ano yung expertise ng faculty? Specific ba yung expertise? Or uh, bahala na lang? <laughs> Then, ano yung facilities available? Is how extensive are your library and laboratory? Kaya ba sa kukundak ng research? Then, ano yung R&D advocacies? For example, what as the Uh, R&D advocacy ng UMAC. And professionalization and licensing are there properly uh, licensed and certified? Then of course, meron kayong IP management sa uh, UMAC of course. Now, To be successful in your research proposal writing and project implementation, you have to learn your two R's. You have to learn how to read technical scientific papers and how to write it. Now, how eh, this is a nakal ko to. You have to visit the portal research for life portal. So, number one is to skim, skim lang. Then reread and interpret and summarize. This is the best way to read scientific uh, papers. So, mga references. So, you have to visit these uh, resources. Research for Life portal, training portal, the LC Bird Publishing Campus, and the Career Advice Portal or LP Bird Connect. Makakatulong yan sa pag-prepare uh, nyo ng uh, documents. Scientific writing, you have to start with the title, the abstract, the introduction, the results and discussion, references. Okay? You have to cite, write, and edit. So, so 
marami rin nga. Uh, so, maganda yung Search for Life Training Portal. You can visit that online. Now, gumagamit ba ang UMAC ng mga apps na ganito? For Grammar Check and Correction, Grammar Link. Kaya lang, kailangan nyo pa, itweak pa rin yan. Hindi pwedeng as is siya dahil merong hindi ano. Turn it in, plagiarism check. Mahal yung software. <laughs> so, pwedeng magano. Killbot. Killbot, para pricing, para hindi maging or word tune. You can use that. So, Bio-render, Canva, presentation, uh, illustration, application tool yan. Para mas mapaganda yung inyong presentation. Ito yung mga tools na pwede makaya lang, hindi sila li karamitan, hindi sila libre. So, merong fees or you have to subscribe or uh, buy the app. These are some na hindi ko pa na-check kung libre yung iba nito. Ha? Yung Glam Grammarly, Hemingway, kung mga literary, Hemingway Editor, Google Doc, of course, you are at Yoast, EO, Daily Page, Call Schedule, Basumo, no, so Killbot, Copyscape is another plagiarism checker. I don't know if that is free. Merong mga libre, pero uh, limited lang yung uh, use at saka application. How do you avoid plagiarism? Number one is to summarize. Ano ba yung nano? Pero then quote and paraphrase. Now, uh, masyadong na ano tayo sa mga expert, pero ano bang definition ng expert? One who studies more and more of less and less until he practically knows everything about nothing. Ito nga yung sinatawag na sinasabi ni philosopher Jose Gasset in Ortega, barbarism of specialization. Ngayon, oh, hindi ko na linya yan. Pasa mo na sa kanya. Diba? Ganun na nangyayari. Pero dati, uh, everything goes. Then, sa, merong, uh, in my reading, there are no true experts in any field. Remember that. Huwag kayong magugulat. Kahit uh, limang PhD yan from Recto University. <laughs> Kasi daw, we, there are no experts in any field, just people with varying levels of ignorance. Magkakaiba lang ang level ng ating ignorance. So, not necessarily. So, meron kaming insider joke sa opisina dati. Ano ang BS? Pag BS daw, believe sa sarili. Hindi ka makakatapos kung hindi ka believe sa sarili. MS, maraming sinasabi kasi maraming na natutunan, maraming na alam. Maraming sinasabi. Pag PhD daw, puro hangin ng dating. Ibang level na, iba na ang language niyan. Minsan, merong, uh, merong nagsabi mga, PhD, minsan parang hindi doktor. <laughs> so, eh, yung mga insider joke. Number two, if you think you're better than others, keep your mouth shut. Don't take the risk of showing your learnings for people might discover your ignorance. Ba? Oh, ay, ay, tapos iwasan natin maging mama or mag-associate with mga hashtag mamas. Ano yung mamas? Yung mamarunong. No, feeling niya, uh, alam niya lahat. <laughs> Mamagaling, kaya siya na ang pinakamagaling. Yung mamayabang, kala mo siya yung ano, yung pinaka main ano sa car ano sa and yung mamalinis pagka nagka palpaka na. Ay, labas ako diyan, hindi ako pasali. So, hashtag. Engineer Prospero. Okay, um, I will, I will. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um really a few seconds to go. Okay. Apologies, but thank you. Okay. Uh, understand. Kasi napaka ano na <laughs> topic natin. So, I think a suggestion for if you are going to produce academic research portal, this is a, a good outline. No? That is useful for so, If you have uh, any other questions, uh, siguro naman, uh, we can, uh, I will allow yung distribution ng copies ng, ano, ng presentation para maging, uh, mag, may pa yung access.
Thank you very much. And apologies that I did have to cut it through um, a few seconds ago, but uh, it's actually also to allow po our participants okay. if they might uh, have a question or two to ask. So once again, for our, I believe, 145 viewers via um, online, we could kindly uh, input it through our chat box. So requesting our tech team to help us with that. For those of us joining um, in person, again, the added incentive is that our CUR uh, team would also be giving out um, bamboo USBs and bamboo pens. So um, if there is a question we'd like to address to Engineer Prospero, now would be the time. Uh, mag ma. Mag, uh, ano to? Mag, tanong. mag tanong pala. <laughs> mag. mag ma. Basta iwasan natin yung mga hashtag mamasa. Marami yan in any field. So, um, Sir Mark is pointing to someone. Are you, please don't hesitate to uh, use the microphones uh, nearest to you. And um, for the benefit of Engineer Prospero, let us kindly introduce ourselves before we ask our question. So, I think... Um, a lot of the topics discussed earlier by uh, Engineer Prosper were, as he mentioned himself, although these are basic, he used the word basic, but these are the things necessary actually um, in order to write a proper research. And if we actually would like to endeavor to um, request for a grant from DOST, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he will be looking for those very things that he discussed earlier. So... Go ahead, Pop. Hello, po. So, um, good morning, po, sir. I am Justine Absidinasal from the Institute of Nursing, po. So, I have a confusion lang po regarding sa references. Kasi uh, may mga, uh, what do you call this? May mga um, websites po kasi na sinasabi that yung EPA 7 po kasi kapag um, nilalagay na po siya sa references or yung sa bibliography po. Yung sa retrieve from po, then my date. But some other websites po kasi sinasabi is that um, nire-remove na po yung date pero meron pa rin pong retrieve from. So ano po ba yung pinakatama po sa dalawa? Uh, you have to ask yung ano, saan kayo magsasubmit ng paper? Kasi usually they determine uh, ano yung citation format that they would that, that they prepare. So, follow the, ano, follow where you are going to submit. Kasi pag hindi, y y y ma ano pa rin, mag magkakaroon ng problem din sa ano. Usually, yan lang sa citation format lang naman, ng mga bibliography. Okay. okay, thank you po. Thank you. Any more um, from the audience? Oh, sorry, online. All right. So we will flash it on screen so you could also see it, Engineer Prospero. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Iba kayo silaw. Oh, there we go. What's the process of seeking a grant? From the uh, OST. <laughs> Usually, there are calls for submission of proposals. You have to look at the web page of uh, the OST. Uh, a lot of the councils, uh, like the Pichard, Philippine Council for Industry, and Emerging... Uh, ayan, nakalimutan ko na. <laughs> Pichard, Picastar, uh, Picas... Uh, these are a lot of councils that... Um, the PCHRD, they uh, set out for the call for submission of proposal. You have to look uh, how to submit. Then you have to follow the strictly the format that they require so that you can submit. Then the review process upon submission, titignan niya merong uh, core group muna na we would uh, grow through your proposal to see if there is merit in the uh, proposal bago nyo na i-elevate. You will in be informed naman, you would be uh, invited to present the, the proposal uh, for possible funding. So, since uh, pwede na ngayon na face-to-face, -face, you can 
ko. Dati kasi puro Zoom ang ano, ang evaluation. So hindi niyo makikipag-zoom kasi hindi niyo makikita yung expression sa mukha ng ano, ng audience niyo. <laughs> okay. So yun, you have to follow yung ano, you have to look at for the notices of the call for submission of proposals of the councils within the OST. Some of the research and development institutes sometimes also call for submission of proposals or you can collab with them. Okay, did I answer the question? <laughs> Thank you for uh, that, uh, Engineer Prospero. It would be safe to say that we should follow your Facebook page then to get this yes. bulletin or uh, 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 go ahead. There are no notices that are uh, given out by the councils on the DOST page. So you have to look, uh, since uh, yeah, one click lang naman, you have access to that. Be, ano lang, be attentive and alert in looking for that. Then you have to follow the deadline of submission. Otherwise, hindi consider yung inyong proposal. Okay. Thank you, Engineer. Also, thank you to uh, Sir June for that question. I'm also prompted by our tech team to also, uh, apart from the 145 viewers from, uh, that we have online from our students and com Yuma community, we have one from Kalapan, all the way from Kalapan, Mindoro. So thank you so much for joining us. It truly is borderless education for uh, all of us. So any more questions that we have from the audience? or uh, online. Uh, Engineer Prospero, there have been uh, requests for your PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Uh, I hear a lot of big yeses here. So, um, just, just do not. <laughs> Spread it around. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, what's that? Um, keep it to yourselves. <laughs> and, um, and we will promise Engineer Prospero that. Okay, so I believe uh, the other questions, we could just uh, forward it also to our CUR team and they will be the ones to also communicate it to Engineer Prospero. Please stay there, Engineer Prospero, as we also uh, give to you the Certificate of Appreciation requesting Professor De Los Santos See you, our director, to please join on stage. If we do have our officers and officials from UMREC, may we also kindly uh, join Professor De Los Santos on stage as we give the certificate of appreciation to him. Go ahead, sir. Yes, sir, Pihano. Professor Pihano. Professor June Lor and Professor Paderan. And as they are joining Professor De Los Santos on stage, please allow me to read the certificate. The University of Makati a Center for University Research award, uh, awards this Certificate of Appreciation to Engineer Rogelio B. Prospero for the invaluable knowledge imparted as resource speaker during the sixth Research Congress with the theme Achieving Global Excellence Through Institutional Synergy, conducted on October 11 and 12, 2023, at the University of Makati, given this day 11th, given this 11th day of October 2023. Signed, Alexor C. Ramos, PhD, Cese, Florante E. De Los Santos, RGC, and Maria Fe, Nanette M. Cariaga, RPH, MSPH, PhD. Once again, a big round of applause. All right. Thank you once again, Engineer Prospera, and thank you for also sharing your slides uh, with us. We promise you we will keep it to ourselves. And on that note, in joining everyone to um, please enjoy lunch. There are tables out uh, prepared outside so that we could partake of it peacefully and uh, Joyfully, I hope. And uh, we would request everyone to please be back at 1 o'clock sharp. Actually, earlier than 1 o'clock p.m. as we will start 1 p.m. sharp. 
So bon appetit, enjoy, and see you later. Thank you very much. Sorry, in addition, um, the CUR team will be going around the tables. They will need to take photos of you guys. So please give your smiles and a little wave if that's okay. Thank you.